uh, I like to thank uh, Kojikode Ophthalmic Society as well as Dr. Shujit Nainar and the uh, president for giving me this opportunity. This is a very special occasion for me to uh, present uh, this um, uh, delivery of the scleritis. Let me share my slides first. Is my slide seen? Yes, sir. Okay, am I audible? Yes, sir, very much. Okay. So, as I told you, it's a very special occasion for me. Down memory lane, 39 years ago, one house staff in regional ophthalmic hospital in Calcutta saw a case of necrotizing scleritis in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis with his teacher. Teacher name was Professor A.C. Shen. That young man was asked to present the case in the monthly ophthalmological meeting at Calcutta. That was his first scientific presentation. And And this was the slide which I printed. Those days, the PowerPoint slides also was not there. And this was the handwritten slides which you have prepared. And this was me 39 years ago. I dedicate my presentations to the loving memory of my teacher, late Professor A.C. Shen, who gave me the first opportunity to present a scientific presentation. This was uh, my teacher, Professor A.C. Shen. I dedicate my talk keynote address in the memory of my teacher. Sclera, what is special in the sclera? It covers five, six, five sixths of the circumference of the globe, but it doesn't, attend, doesn't attract that much of attention. It is composed of collagen and elastic tissue, transmit blood vessels, but retains very scanty supply. It has got a low metabolic demand, gets nutrition through the episclera and underlying choroid. Affected by the collagen disease like granulomatous inflammation, autoimmune process like Wegener's granulomatosis, etc. So it is one of the differential diagnoses, as Dr. Shojit was telling, is the red eye, and it uh, comes with a dull, uh, boring, aching pain, significant redness, systemic complaints. Many have been, some of them have decreased visual acuity. Systemic history sometimes is positive, and investigations also can be productive in such cases. And systemic medications, including corticosteroids, immunosuppressive agents has been used, has been found to be beneficial. I'm not going into the details of how to differentiate acute conjunctivitis, episcleritis, scleritis, acute iridocyclitis, or acute angle closure glaucoma. I'll be showing one or two cases to show that how an anterior scleritis or posterior scleritis present. Little bit basic. Uh, this is a Watson-Harris classification, which is a quite age-old classification. Shonshin Harry from India, both of them were Moorfields, brought out this classification. Scleritis is divided into two parts, anterior and posterior. Anterior is further classified into the diffuse nodular necrotizing. Necrotizing can be with inflammation, the necrotizing scleritis, and without inflammation. Actually, it's not without inflammation, but inter inflammation is clinically not evident. There's a scleromalacia. So this is the various uh, types of scleritis we encounter. I'm not going into the details. I will show each of them as the talk goes on. There can be a really a serious complications like corneal involvement, scleral, rupture, scleral perforation, and um, scleral thinning significant scleral thinning. So today I'm going as told, as I'll be talking about non-infectious scleritis, I will not touch upon the management. I'll talk about the investigations a little bit. Scleritis and episcleritis, as you know, are the inflammation of the outer coat of the eye, but have varied characteristics. And you can see this simple diagram show the normal, and in episcleritis, that ep superficial episcleral vessels are bored up and Deep uh, scleral vessels are bored up, as well as the superficial episcleral plexus is bored up in case of scleritis. There is a scleral edema is noted. 
So episcleritis is benign inflammation of the episcleral tissue. It doesn't cause permanent structural damage and mostly unassociated with systemic disease, except some hypersensitivity to the tuberculosis. Where the scleritis is other side of the coin, can cause visual impairment, produces permanent structural changes, and often associated, which is very important, with a serious systemic disease or autoimmune process. This can involve the adjacent structure, as this slide shows that the cornea, peripheral cornea is involved, sclerokeratitis, or it can be scleroeuveitis. So all cases of scleritis, apart from the torchlight examination, you need to see in the street lamp for evidence of anterior uveitis. Anterior scleritis is up to the ora serrata. Posterior scleritis is beyond the ora serrata. These are the two different uh, is anatomical division. But there is a, some people called pan scleritis, both anterior and posterior segment, uh, posterior sclera is involved. So in the examination, external examination of the eye in, eye in daylight is uh, often advisable, but it's not practical. Episcleritis will give a salmon pink appearance. Scleritis color itself is different, deep purple, and scleral thinning is better visible in the daylight examination. Slit lab examination, you should do the diffuse illumination and red-free light. Scleritis should show scleral edema and congestion of the deep episcleral vessels. The avascular patch, if you see in close examination with the slit lamp, that indicates poor prognosis. Necrotizing process has started and the corneal changes can you, you can see. This is the red-free illumination will, uh, which will uh, stands out the deep episcleral vessel congestion. So if you do a phenylephrine test, constriction of the conjunctival and superficial episcleral vessels are uh, done, the constriction occurs, and the deep scleral plexus becomes prominent. So many of the patients say that I have got redness, I have got episcleral, I got redness, and when you come uh, to the examination, slit lab examination, you would not find anything. So this indicates that the patient probably have superficial episcleritis. This is the before 10% uh, phenylephrine test with the episcleritis component and scleritis component is there. Episcleritis component uh, goes off after the 10% phenylephrine application and the deep scleral vessels becomes prominent. How the scleritis present is almost always painful except scleromalacia, typically dull boring pain, radiate to the ER, scalp, forehead, and exercises by eye movement. Worsens at night, typically waking up in the patients from the sleep in the early hours of the morning. And they do not respond to this usual analgesic like paracetamol, etc. 17% patient posterior scleritis may be asymptomatic. So posterior scleritis is often difficult to diagnose. They can have pain on movements of the globe, but 17% of the patient may be asymptomatic. Diffuse and nodular scleritis comes with a sign of, sign of scleral edema and congestion of the deep episcleral vessels. And here this schematic diagram shows that the deep episcleral vessels are elevated and there's a scleral edema and superficial episcleral vessels is also congested. There's no watertight barrier between the superficial sclera and the deep sclera. This is a diffuse anterior scleritis. It almost comes about 30 to 40% of the cases, most common type of the scleritis. And if you look carefully, you can see the dilated uh, deep episcleral vessels. As you've seen that the diffuse dilated deep scleral vessels are seen. And this is nodular scleritis and can have one single nodule, which is more common, but can have multiple nodules as shown in this picture. Necrotizing scleritis, rare, but severe form of scleritis. And there's a scleral thinning, uveal show is seen. And they can be dangerous, can lead to the perforation of the sclera. And can even the uveal tissue can prolapse out. And this can be really is a alarming. Scleromalacia is the extensive scleral thinning. And sometimes uveal staphyloma is seen. These are the few examples of scleromalacia usually associated with the long-standing 
rheumatoid arthritis. This is another picture of sclerosmalacia, and you can see the uveal tissue is bulging. Scleritis and systemic disease is the most important uh, aspect. 50% of the scleritis is associated with the systemic disease. Systemic disease varies with the clinical subtypes. Posterior scleritis is have less systemic association. And I feel it's indeed a crime not to in, investigate for systemic disease in scleritis. The most common systemic disease associated with scleritis is rheumatoid arthritis, followed by granulomatosis with polyangitis, earlier known as the Wegner's granulomatosis. You know that way Wegner's name was removed because he was a Nazi. Relapsing polychondritis, polyarthritis nodosa, systemic lupus erythematosa. This is a picture uh, together with the scleritis. I took the picture with the rheumatoid arthritis. You can see that same picture. The patient is having rheumatoid arthritis as well as decrising scleritis. Rheumatoid arthritis and scleritis, about 20% of the scleritis will have rheumatoid arthritis, one, which is one of the most common association. But if you look at the rheumatoid arthritis, 0.2 to 6.3% will have scleritis. A lot of the rheumatoid arthritis patients do not have scleritis. Granulomatosis polyangitis, that was earlier known as the Wegener's granulomatosis, most common cause of vasculitis associated scleritis, more severe presentation, more aggressive case, and can be localized form of granulomatous polyangitis. polyangitis. And this is uh, limited to the eye only. Scleritis and relapsing polychondritis can be bilateral, nodular, diffuse, and necrotizing. Scleritis and SLE, I have not seen a single case, but uncommon but severe complication of SLE can be diffuse, nodular, or posterior scleritis, rarely necrotizing. Drug-induced scleritis for completion, compl completion is very uncommon. Biphosphonate is known to cause um, drug-induced scleritis. Even, even, even the mood elevated drug, methamphetamine, also can cause scleritis. Surgically induced necrotizing scleritis is uh, one of the um, dreadful in, uh, scleritis form. And nowadays it has become increasingly rare. After pterygium excision is quite common, uh, cataract extraction, trabeculectomy, penetrating keratoplasty, strabismus surgery, retinal detachment repair. And it's a rare complication. But the name appears to be uh, to me as a little uh, difficult for me to address uh, because I had a patient of surgically induced necrotizing scleritis. I give the case summary in the patient's hand, and patient was a lawyer. He sued the doctor because he said that is a surgically induced uh, scleritis he has produced. So this term may need to be probably taken with caution. Posterior scleritis, as Watson put it that one, must be the one of the most underdiagnosed treatable condition in ophthalmology, partly because its manifestations are so protean and partly because the diagnosis is rarely considered. And it doesn't have the uh, kind of classic features. They can have uh, uh, folds in the str or stria in the posterior fold or can have nodules. And these nodules uh, can be uh, seen on ultrasonography and can have complete T sign or partial T sign, showing with high surface and low internal reflectivity is seen in the swelling. This is one of the cases called giant nodular posterior scleritis. This is a 50 year old female with pain on movements of the globe. But if you look at the FFA, is uh, showed that the diffuse hyperfluorescence in the late stage. What is very important is that uh, ultrasound can be made, um, can, be, can clinch the diagnosis in such cases. And they respond to oral steroid, it melts actually with oral steroid. And you can see that from the nodules has completely disappeared and you don't see trace of it. This is called giant nodular posterior scleritis, rare condition, often mistaken for an intraocular tumor, especially amelanotic choroidal melanoma, choroidal hemangioma, or metastatic tumor. As we told you, ultrasonography clinches the diagnosis. It will show that uh, T signs and sclerochoroidal thickening. Good response to systemic steroid is the hallmark. 
posterior sclerosis is often idiopathic systemic association up to 28% cases is seen now i'll show a case of anterior scleritis which i have faced and this is a very challenging case 33 year old male pain and redness in the left eye joint pain cough with hemoptysis low grade fever but when he came he came with the necrotizing scleritis with uveal prolapse i did the investigation it came esr 114 mm per hour i was there really is a sur surprise i didn't see an oignal before mantu was negative ra factor and c anka was positive urine analysis was abnormal when i looked in the posterior segment i could find out the retinitis peripheral retinitis with exurative retinal detachment and his chest x ray showed cavity in both lungs in fact he was getting treatment for um, tuberculosis uh, the pulmonologist thought that it is a tuberculosis and getting treatment for the time same so bronchoalveolar lavage was done and which was pseudomonas was positive ab was positive he was started on tablet metronidazole and injection garamycin that time it was available in topical steroid and antibiotic but in a few days four days later the things changes palpable purpura on the hand on feet blood urea was 47 mg serum creatinine was uh, 4 mg and progressive retinitis reaching towards the posterior pole and then that time the renal biopsy was done and this showed presenting glomerular nephritis c anka was positive cavities were seen on ct scan and ultrasound guided aspiration from the lung cavity showed hemorrhagic and sterile pus so treatment we need to do dialysis iv methylprednisolone for 3 days pulse intravenous cyclophosphamide followed by the oral cyclophosphamide 50 mg one tablet uh, two times daily topical steroid topical antibiotic scleral graft was advised once systemic conditions removed and in fact it did well is that uveal prolapse was covered by fibrous tissue peripheral corneal ulceration was healing retinitis resolved disappearance of the purpura lesion and one year after you can see that there is a dramatic improvement patient was well but systemically patient did not do well patient died due to the systemic complications after one year in spite of the treatment now another case of this is a 43 year old female with dimness of vision for 6 months occasional pain redness and watering right sided headache patient was on oral steroid symptoms have improved but when i looked into the one fundus i could see the stria on the uh, fundus and this was more evident on the red free you can see that and this was actually a posterior scleritis t sign was uh, found to be positive here and ct scan was done in those those days in the posterior scleritis you don't need it in the posterior sclera was taken so posterior scleritis can be confused with metastatic tumor amyloidic melanoma pseudo tumor and posterior uveitis this was not my slide it's it is a case i was inoculated in the suspicion of tumor and you can see that the posterior sclera is taken which gives that impression of the tumor this is the posterior sclera taken posterior sclera general examination is quite important as i told you uh, is it is associated with many serious systemic disease joints cardiovascular system skin has to be looked carefully for relapsing polychondritis rheumatoid arthritis systemic lupus erythematosus episcleritis as i told you earlier it has got associated the atopy erythema nodosum contact dermatitis tuberculosis which is not much significance you don't need to treat for that but scleritis can be associated with the collagen vascular disease inflammatory bowel disease gout and others scleritis and oignus granulomatosis is often very uh, challenging can lead to the perforations and often require um, sometimes requires a scleral patch graft i am not going into the any anything of management which is be dealt by uh, dr somshila why should you do look for systemic disease in scleritis because the scleritis can be initial manifestation of unexpected systemic disease 
I do have many patients of 30 years follow up of uh, uveitis, choroiditis, et cetera. But I don't have many patients of necrotizing scleritis, which is coming 30 years or 40 years. I think that's uh, maybe the, uh, some of the patients may succumb to systemic disease which they are having. Aggressive therapy may be required not only to save the eye, but also the patient's life. Episcleritis, I don't investigate at all. Scleritis, two things I do. One is the rheumatoid factor. Another is the ANCA, antineutrophilic cytoplasmic antibody. I don't forget to do it. Others is the TLC, ASR, C-reactive protein, MANTU, and rule out syphilis. Uh, as you know, it can mimic all type of uh, disease, inflammatory diseases. So. Scleritis complications, 70% of the patients can have complications. Elevated IOP, 40% of the patients. Cataract, up to 50% of the patients. So ancillary test, I will be touching on it. Anterior segment OCT, ultrasound B scan, which I shown you uh, on posterior scleritis, ultrasound biomicroscopy, CT scan of the eye and orbit to rule out pseudotumor. UVM in scleritis, I was working on scleritis, can detect the extent and degree of damage caused by the scleritis can help in planning the therapy. This was uh, presented in the 2000, 20 years back. I was doing ultrasound biomicroscopy. I was presenting in the Argentina this year. Then one of the people is saying, why are you doing ultrasound, bi ultrasound biomicroscopy? Although the, already the sclera is, pay, the patient is having pain due to the sclera and you are putting the probe over there. So I uh, reduced my doing the ultrasound biomicroscopy. You can, if you do it, then you can see the scleral edema and scleral thickening. And this ciliary body edema can also be picked up by ultrasound biomicroscopy. Cyst can be seen, interstellar blaze, and calcification. I end up with a case uh, with a scleritis case. This is a 47 year old male with two months. Nowadays, I do the anterior segment. Uh, anterior segment A, anterior segment um, examination ASOCT I do instead of UBM. I am now I show a patient which is a challenging case, 42 year old male with two months history of pain, uh, swelling, and redness was suspected as a scleral tumor. He was referred to us for brachytherapy. And we did the ultrasound, uh, uh, there one, no intraocular extension. Scleral coat was only thickened. UVM showed homogeneous mass arising from the episcleral and sclera. I just show the picture again. This is a mass lesion. Do you think is a collagen disease induced scleritis? So we did the routine investigations. Nodular scleral disease. Patient was asymptomatic, major systemic illness and see what we got. RA factor negative, ANA negative, VDRL and RPR and TPHA was positive. When the patient was put on benzathine penicillin intravenous, and then this uh, showed complete resolution. So it is a nodular syphilitic scleritis, masquerading as ocular tumor, we published this case. So in summary, that scleritis don't think so simple, Always, always investigate. Get a checkup by a physician, preferably by a rheumatologist, and keep the posterior scleritis in any um, posterior segment involvement where you don't see, it. like, except choroiditis cases, you should keep the posterior scleritis in mind because it has got protein manifestation. Thank you very much. So, I thank again uh, Dr. Shujit and Kojiket Ophthalmic Society for giving me this opportunity to pay uh, respect to my teacher, Professor A.C. Shen, with whom I presented the, my first talk in my life in, as an ophthalmologist, scleritis. Thank you very much. I stop sharing. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for that exhaustive talk. Um, I think a lot of points have been, new points also we've got from here. So we'll come to the question, sir. There's uh, one question from Dr. Meher. Do you fully investigate for systemic causes at the first episode of scleritis? So I do investigate. Uh, first, uh, every, every case of scleritis, I do investigate. 
I do that, uh, as I told you, the lab investigations, and I definitely send it to the rheumatologist to all, all the cases, even except episcleritis. Scleritis always do. Thank you, sir. Particularly <laughs> necrotizing and scleritis, for sure. Yeah, that needs a systemic work, a complete work. Yeah. yeah. And also a rheumatologist's uh, opinion also. Uh, at this Nowadays. point, I want to welcome Dr. Anouf, uh, consultant rheumatologist, who has joined us. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, this was, sir, uh, like, uh, have you seen a case of drug-induced scleritis? No. In your practice? No. Any of the other panelists have seen? Uh, Dr. Somshela, Dr. M. Vanati. I have not yet come across uh, drug-induced uh, spiritus so far. Maybe Soames should have seen more, I guess. So me neither. There was nothing that we could conclusively prove that it is drug-induced, so I have not seen any. So, uh, right now, there are no questions. So can we go to the next talk? We'll come back to you, sir. Yes, sir. Come Thank on. you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Dr. Mahir? Thank you, Dr. Biswas, for that uh, wonderful talk. So our next talk is uh, about an equally important topic, uh, infectious scleritis by Dr. M. Vanati. Uh, Dr. Vanati did her post-graduation in ophthalmology from uh, RP Center, All Indian Institute of Medical Sciences. She did her residency training in cornea, contact lens, eye banking, cataract, and refractive surgery from RP Center. She has also obtained an international fellowship in corneal lamella surgery from Singapore National Eye Center. She has over 95 international index publications and numerous chapters in international ophthalmology books to her credit. She is currently working as professor of ophthalmology, cornea, cataract and refractive surgery services at RP Center. I invite Dr. Vanuti to give her a uh, talk on infectious scleritis, clinical presentations and diagnostic signs. Thank you, Dr. Meher, for those uh, for the nice introduction. And I, I should thank at the outset uh, both Dr. Vijayalakshmi and Dr. Sujit for having me on this wonderful uh, academic session. Infectious scleritis is something which is rarely discussed uh, in depth. Scleritis per se itself is, is rarely discussed. Um, so I'm going to limit myself for the next 15 minutes or so to the various looks of infectious scleritis, focusing per se on uh, clinical presentation and the various diagnostic signs here. I do not have any financial interests uh, in the mention of any products or, uh, uh, or procedures during the course of uh, this talk here. I might have a little overlap uh, to what Dr. Biswas uh, explained to us earlier. That was a very exhaustive and a, a very lovely talk which he had presented. So when you're looking at infectious keratitis, you're going to look at what are the organisms which are causing infectious keratitis here. And you would find in most of the cases, there would be a preceding history of trauma here. So that's going to be a very a salient feature when you are looking at infectious keratitis. There's always a history of uh, surgery also in cases, uh, in most of these cases. And as Dr. Vizwas rightly pointed out earlier, it would be pterygium small incision cataract surgeries, trabeculectomies, retinal detachment surgeries, and of course you have uh, a much later presentation with surgical induced necroting scleritis, necrotizing scleritis. You always will have ocular or systemic association. So this is something which you always need to look for here. And uh, the infectious scleritis could be secondary to an ocular infection or could be secondary to a systemic infection here. Ocular, you can find an endophthalmitis, a posterior inflammation of the globe here. It commonly would be associated with uh, infectious uh, peripheral ulcerative keratitis. So these are two common conditions here. The more uncommon ones I will touch upon when I am uh, uh, I'm briefing you more or elaborating more on the other features. The systemic infections which are commonly associated with scleritis would be tuberculosis, leprosy, trypanomal infections, and syphilis. So these are the common systemic infections and, um, uh, and uh, as in, in the nice case illustration which Dr. Biswa showed. Uh, several times uh, there's something which uh, we probably miss on uh, in these infections. So it is always good to go and rule out these and investigate for these when you are looking at uh, a patient of scleritis here. 
And last but not the least, the masquerade presentations of infectious colitis. This also, sir, had covered uh, elaborately. So you have conjunctival tumors and you have posterior segment tumors, something like melanomas. The common ones are conjunctival intraepithelial neoplasias, the ocular surface squamous neoplasias, you have lymphomas. I've also seen uh, not a tumor, but a rhinosporidiasis presenting like a tumor here. And uh, so that's another masquerade with uh, scleritis and uh, posterior tumors, melanomas are the common ones which you would, uh, uh, which would uh, present as uh, similar to a scleritis here. And uh, as Sir's lovely ultrasound pictures did show you, the mass session is always seen on a posterior scleritis sometimes. And uh, you could see a B scan showing a high internal reflectivity and a retrobulbar uh, ecolucent eco area which presents as an edema in the tenon. So when you look at these, you will be able to differentiate a posterior scleritis, but usually easily said than done. There could be more, uh, these could be more diff difficult clinical scenarios here. So just to look at a, a broad outlook at uh, what are the various organisms which can cause infectious scleritis. So you have bacteria, fungi, virus, amoeba, parasites. This was again, uh, this is again from the, the survey of Thal article, which is uh, way back in 2005. And uh, since then you have several more organisms which have been published and which do cause infectious scleritis. But keep in mind among bacteria, you have the Haemophilus and uh, Pseudomonas is more common here. You could have staph and strepto species here. And the more indolent organisms being uh, tuberculosis, uh, mycobacteria, leprosy, and syphilis here. Of course, nocardial scleritis is something which several people tend to miss here. And there are geographical uh, predominances to the occurrence of this infectious condition here. Among fungi, you could get aspergillus. You do see a lot of fusarium here, especially people who are doing uh, a lot of therapeutics here. You would find that the recurrences would be associated with uh, uh, with scleritis, and that could be one reason why it's very difficult to manage these cases here. Viruses, Epstein-Barr, Coxsackie, varicella here, here. We could have even herpes here, but these are rare presentations, but uh, viruses can also lead to scleritis. Acanthamoeba is one real uh, difficult scenario here, and Acanthamoeba cyst can remain dormant in the sclera and present several years after the corneal infection has healed. And these patients will tend to come back with, uh, uh, with severe pain and, uh, and scleritis lesions. I have seen one such patient during my fellowship in the Singapore National Eye Center, a very difficult case to see. To treat ultimately required almost several forms of interventions So this particular young girl here, who started off with, with a simple acanthamoeba, small opacity here. So that's one condition where you would find a lot of acanthamoebal uh, nodules in the sclera here. Parasitic infections may not be very common, but you might have to keep them in mind and uh, rule them out when you are not able to find out uh, what particular uh, organism is causing it. Other than toxoplasma, you do have trypanomal infections as well here. So this is not an exhaustive list, but something which you could always bear in the back of your mind when you are uh, managing these cases. I think this is sort of going to be a repetition of what Sir said here. And uh, most of the scleral lesions can have an overlying episclerar inflammation, which could be in order or diffuse in the initial stages and the patient would come on on your second or, or subsequent visits with a frank scleritis here. The anterior scleritis can be diff nodular, diffuse and necrotizing with or without inflammation. And when the inflammation is silent without pain, it becomes scleromalacia perforans. Posterior scleritis again can be nodular, can be defined to a particular a particular region, could be diffuse, and you could have necrotizing as well. We'll now move on to a few clinical pictures here so that our understanding becomes uh, more vivid here. So here you have a diffuse infectious scleritis, which is occurring here in all around in almost uh, more than 180 degrees of the circumferential part around the clonia here, a close-up view of these and the patient usually presents with significant pain here. Here you have associated severe necrotizing inflammation and you have the underlying scleral show, the scleral thinning here and a lots of uveal material and it's also having an adjoining, uh, adjoining corneal lesion. Several times it could be the corneal lesion which has gone and spread into involve the, the adjacent sclera here. That's again a close up look of this particular patient. A nodular scleritis generally tends to look like this. This is more for our uh, residents and our postgraduates here. So it's more of a localized lesion out here. And this is a surgical induced uh, necrotizing scleritis, which was seen several years following a, a, a successful pterygium surgery in this particular patient here. 
some of clinical pictures here here you have a severe non necrotizing form of diffuse scleritis anterior scleritis in this particular pictures here and here you have multiple nodules multiple punched out lesions here remember these commonly could be characteristic of nocardia here so nocardia can present as a slow indolent infection the patient might not be really very symptomatic unless you lift up the lid here but the blinding complications associated with it is what would alert the clinician and can and get the patient to meet your doctor so multiple punched out lesions like this extending throughout the globe you would find when one is healing the other one starts start showing up and these are really become very difficult scenarios to manage here you have more of necrotizing scleritis here you have a lot of adjoining inflammation which you're seeing spreading on into the cornea as well in this particular case Again, here is a peripheral ulcerative keratitis here, or more of a sclerosing keratitis here, or sclerokeratitis. You you find the the adjoining lesion is largely inflamed, largely informed with several infiltrates involving more than almost close to one eighty degrees of the adjoining cornea as well. So a sclerokeratitis presentation is also something where the both the cornea and the sclera tend to get involved, but you don't have see the characteristic ulcerative lesions as you would see in a a PUK. these are cases of healed scleritis patients have had multiple episodes and they they do tend to be on follow up with us here and you would find a large area of the adjoining sclera in the anterior part being uh, very thin with the uveal tissue showing through here so these are uh, some of the uh, some of the looks of infectious scleritis infectious scleritis a quick recap on um, on what are the salient features about 18% of cases of scleritis are only considered to be infectious here but something which is considered rare but you also might find the look would be very similar to what you would find in a, a non infectious or an immune scleritis here so you probably need to rule out all the immune conditions before you would go on to get and label it as an infectious pathology and several times it's very difficult to isolate an organ infectious organism it's not as easy as you would in in case of infectious keratitis and mind you even in infectious keratitis isolating organisms need a a very detailed diagnostic work up here the pain varies depending upon the clinical presentation whether they are simple nodular forms or their extensive necrotizing forms the nodules can be either solitary or multifocal and uh, the presentation in terms of scleritis occurring subsequent to trauma can be can vary from several days to years following the primary uh, primary trauma here the acute bacterial infections have a very rapid course of melt where you have indolent infections secondary to fungi nocardia mycobacteria which have a, a slow onset uh, which have a slow uh, slow course of the clinical of the clinical presentation here ten times as i already said can be indistinguishable from a an immune uh, uh, immune scleritis here and uh, the selection of an appropriate treatment hence becomes difficult as you are not able to pinpoint on the on the diagnosis of these cases always bear in the back of the mind these are patients who would have come back to you for management of other comorbidities arising as a result of the scleritis so vision threatening complications like cataract glaucoma and ophthalmitis loss of vision and subsequent thysis can occur in these cases here this is a condition which you will really need to be wary of so more pictures here you have a, a very localized case of infectious keratitis in this particular patient differentiation between episcleritis and scleritis i think i won't touch upon sir has already elaborated it very de detailed manner here manner earlier so this is a particular picture of a fusarium keratitis i thank anita we from uh, irvin the colonel valley for sharing some of her experiences with me here So here you could see a, a corneal button done here, a therapeutic keratoplasty. Uh, so it's an opaque button here, and the patient has returned to her about a year later following the therapeutic keratoplasty, and a scraping confirmed this as a fusarium scleritis here. So that's uh, how a fusarium scleritis presents here. You have another similar case is a recently done therapeutic keratoplasty. You can see the, the lenticule here. The surrounding sclera has started getting infected and showing a nodule out here. and this is about a week after the therapeutic keratoplasty earlier presenting with just a simple lymphitis and then proceeding on to a frank fusarium abscess on the adjoining region of the of the sclera here so she particularly managed it with a with a drainage on slit lamp sent for culture and the patient subsequently i guess did not come back to her later on 
another case of uh, a fungal scleritis this was occurring uh, this occurred following trauma following a thorn injury where you were having a, a localized irregular nodular elevation seen particularly in this patient with a history of thorn was seen in the ot the thorn removed here with an incision and drainage and managed with antifungal here and the patient resolved here so those are different or varying presentations of uh, fungal keratitis occurring after different clinical scenarios these are again pictures of scleritis occurring secondary to um, cytomegalovirus infections here this was a patient with cmb positive with the cmb keratitis here and the adjoining scleritis here in this particular patient here this is a classical picture with most of our cornea surgeons do see we have peripheral ulcerative keratitis involving a large part circumferentially classical features of an infectious peripheral peripheral ulcerative keratitis with scleritis of the adjoining uh, with the adjoining sclera of the cornea which has been involved so that's how you largely do differentiate a puk because of an infectious lesion and and uh, uh, murens ulcer in in uh, clinical scenarios so this was one particular uh, case which was co-managed by um, me and my junior colleague dr lomi in um, in rt center here and this was a young girl who presented with uh, multiple lesions i think i had presented this in one of the kerala conferences recently as well as one of the challenging or interesting cases here and this patient was a case of uh, suspected case of besset syndrome had uh, classical features of conjunctivitis oral lesions urethritis skin lesions here she was subsequently investigated for the, for the besset's disease here and this is how she presented with a, a circumferential, circumferential peripheral ulcerative melt along with a circumferential nodular uh, circumferential diffuse anterior scleritis with significant scleral melts and um, uveal prolapse and show and and required multiple surgical interventions in terms of extensive patch grafts interventions to save that particular eye this was a bilateral presentation in this particular patient yet another case this is an immune scleritis where you are seeing a a sort of a, a, a less a less um, a less invasive or a, a, or a less active lesion it is more more quieter compared and if you look at it it sometimes becomes very difficult to differentiate this from an infectious lesion to also remember your immune scleritis can have secondary infections and uh, that's something which you need to rule out so quick look or let's let's quickly run through the several pointers in infectious scleritis so up to 10 or 18% of cases of uh, of scleritis tend to be infectious they can have a poor prognosis especially in aggressive infections and because of the avascular nature of the sclera which also had which also does not enable good drug penetration in management a variety of organisms from bacteria virus fungi protozoa Uh, will be involved uh, in these infectious lesions and the infections can be either endogenous or exogenous here trauma immunosuppression conjunctival pterygium surgeries are common region specific systemic infections something which the treating physician needs to keep in mind like tuberculosis syphilis toxoplasma or leprosy here the presentation can be varied depending upon the severity of the lesion or the morbidity of the condition which is being associated which is being uh, which is presenting here bacterial scleritis uh, can have a delayed occurrence even after surgery or trauma and can still be a dormant organism and not necessarily have to present in a virulent aggressive progression here when you look at diagnostics you would probably look at uh, using the help of uh, ultra biomicroscopic imaging here upm imaging anterior segment octs and uh, several uh, several papers is something when i did look at literature it was interesting to find the people do look at ct orbits to uh, also to uh, take the help of ct orbits for as a diagnostic modality in the, in managing and in uh, looking at the progress of the conditions here goes without seeing you would want to do scleral scapings here to isolate the organisms here and now with the extended diagnostics molecular diagnostics to our help you have uh, pcrs of the tissue specimens either from your scrapings or for your biopsies and immunofluorescence which can really help you and uh, in the diagnosis of your infectious organism here but it is always imperative that you rule out an immune pathology before you would initiate a treatment for a case of infectious keratitis should remember in the mind that starting high doses of uh, immunosuppressants and steroids could be detrimental in a case of infectious scleritis so this makes it that much more difficult for your treating physician especially if the clinical conditions cannot be really clear, clear cut in uh, when they are presenting to you and remember you would probably need to give intravenous 
systemic antibiotics, intravenous antibiotics, along with surgical excision cryotherapy in the management of recalcitrant cases here. Nocardia scleritis, as I showed you here, can have multiple nodules here, can have poor responses to fluoroquinolones. This is one condition where nocardia probably will not, does not tend to uh, nicely respond to your, uh, your medical management here. Mycotic scleritis, again, have uh, rapid, can have progression, poor prognosis, and these are patients who have associated cataracts, serous detachments, choroidal detachments here and end of palmitis and uh, late diagnosis or penetration of your medical management all result in poor prognosis of these cases here. Mycobacterium is something which you probably will have to rule out. It is not always mandatory that uh, you have systemic lesions here, but I do find this in our part that several of the of cases that uh, patients are put on anti anti um, uh, anti tuberculosis treatment on a suspicion of mycobacterium, which is something I think um, several of us do not agree upon here. Toxoplasma and trypanomal infections also need to be considered here. A quick look at certain diagnostics here. So this is one particular paper which I was able to lo locate, and uh, they've used a CT orbit for following up and have recommended this as one of the other modalities. But I think we do have the ASOCT and UBM for to good effect that we really do not need to move on to a CT unless and until you feel it's really required. Just sharing a couple of my experiences uh, with my colleagues at our center where we had looked at masquerades of infectious scleritis. Uh, these were actually tumors which presented as scleritis here and you could see a couple of these cases here, your large diffuse scleral nodules here. This of course is more classical of uh, ocular surface uh, malignancy here. But uh, uh, a UBM in these cases really helps to pick up and uh, helps to show the extensive involvement of these OSSN picture, OSSN cases here. So that's something that you would always need to remember when you are managing cases of infectious scleritis. This was again another particular interesting case here. Came with a nodule which had healed and a melt and I done a, a patch graft for this particular because he had presented with an extensive necrosis here. And on subsequent follow-up, I found that, that the patient had another nodule which had developed a little away from uh, the or uh, from the earlier lesion here. And the fundus picture showed an extensive serous detachment as well with the posterior extension. Uh, we did subsequently had to go and uh, and manage this patient and take and a nucleate this eye. This was an invasive OSSN here confirmed on histopathology here. And this is a UBM picture of the particular patient here. So those are masquerade syndromes. And uh, in infectious scleritis, the complications of scleral thinning, corneal thinnings, perforations, you will prolapse. Secondary glaucomas, hypotony, uveitis, cataract, occurrence of cataract, posterior segment problems, anterior segment ischemia, subsequent thysis, the, uh, uh, the chances of these occurring could be quite high and the physician needs to be prepared for managing here. I'm not going to delve into the depths of diagnostics in, in terms of ocular microbiology. It's pretty much similar to what you would do for any other infections like keratitis or end of thalmitis, your gram stainings, your KOH stains. So I'm just quickly going to flip over to these sites because of uh, a lack of time. But remember culture sensitivity, diagnostics, scleral scrapings, the smears, culture inoculations. And today I think we also have a good momentum on um, on antibiotic sensitivity testing to see if these cases are responding to the management which you're giving here. So that would be another extensive help even you would take with your ocular microbiology colleague here and to see uh, if these uh, difficult scenarios are responding to the antibiotics or the antimicrobials which you are giving. In cases where difficult diagnosis, one-eyed patients, you probably would like to look at uh, molecular diagnostics like uh, a PCR to isolate the organism here. And this is a case which I just did uh, recently about um, two weeks ago, the patient. I'm sorry for these pictures because we couldn't take good uh, clinical pictures. These are taken out of my surgical video here. So just done about two weeks ago, the patient presented what was a case of uh, scleritis seen earlier and uh, resolved, uh, though we didn't have a particular diagnosis on what the organism was. We still thought she was an infectious, um, she was an immune keratitis and uh, she came back about six months later here. And this time, a particular inflammation and melt in an uh, infranasal part of her um, uh, infrapase part of the globe with extensive melt and uh, necrosis and uh, uveal prolapse here. So I had to do a large, um, uh, I uh, used to tend to use corneal tissue itself as a tectonic patch for this scleroconeal melt here. 
and uh, she's currently recovering and uh, we isolated coagulase neg and negative staphylococcus aureus in this particular patient. These are similar pictures as you would get in um, infectious peripheral ulcerative keratitis patients with very severe nevomitis here, blepharokeratoconjunctivitis, they have staphylococcal immune abscesses also which can uh, lead to such presentations here. I had one other patient of rhinosporidiasis, which presented with extensive conjunctival lesions, scleral melts, for which I, I, I'm sorry, I could not locate the photographs of that particular patient here, and had to do extensive scleral glass for this patient. He came back later with about uh, two or three years later for his cataract surgery, and still enjoys a vision of 618 um, after this extensive, though there is, there is a little staphylomatous pr of a protrusion in the, in the sclera because of his extensive inflammation. So what you need to think about in management is the broad spectrum coverage, the availability of the antibiotics, uh, the cost, the region specific epidemiology, and uh, apart from uh, the use of steroids, anti-glaucoma treatment, cycloplegic lubricants, and you're taking them for long-term management. Closing with just one particular slide on what you would need on the management for the various infections. This is pretty much similar, as I said earlier, to the management of infectious keratitis for your gram positive cocci, negative cocci, um, negative rods, cocci for your mycobacteria. So this is something which is there available in the textbooks. And um, this is pretty much similar to the, the line of management of infectious keratitis. For resistant organisms, you do have uh, much more. Um, uh, you have vancomycin, you have uh, the use of, uh, for pseudomonas, you have linozolate, colostin, imipenem, and remember, you would probably need to give them intravenous in cases of, uh, of scleritis patients. Yeah. This is again a slide of just how you could make all these organ all these formulations. I think I will, sc I will stop here and we'll, we'll hear more about management from Somshila. Thank you again, and I wish to acknowledge um, all of my friends, Jata, Revati, Anita from uh, uh, Medivind, LVPI, Bhubaneshwar Sujata, and Lomi, who shared some of their pictures to make this a very interesting uh, talk. Thank you again for the opportunity to be with all of you on this Independence Day. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for the exhaustive talk and such great clinical photos. I think uh, it it was very, very interesting. There are a few questions Dr. Somshila is answering on the uh, chat box. I'll just read it out. Uh, one main question is, how do you differentiate between infectious and non-infectious? What are the pointers to say that it's an infectious scleritis? Then you commonly see um, non-infectious cases because we generally, when you when the approach to a management of a scleritis is that you tend, by and large, to look at it as an as an immune keratitis or an idiopathic keratitis. Is what you generally and pointers towards infection are the it, it is usually very aggressive. You have necrosis, you have purulent discharge in these patients here, and several times, uh, as the, Dr. Biswas also rightly pointed out, you would probably want to rule out immune conditions which could be associated. Uh, so a good history taking from these patients looking at systemic pointers for a systemic infection here. So that's how you would really would want to differentiate. Frag infections, usually it's not a, a difficulty here. And you would be able to, uh, if you do a simple corneal uh, scleral scraping here, you would be able to isolate these cases here. Uh, doctor, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Prithviraj is asking, how common is keratitis associated with ocular tuberculosis? Um, I, I think when you look at uh, look at cases of uh, systemic tuberculosis, you have patients who have frank history of uh, and anti-tuberculous treatment. I've had patients who have had earlier history of anti-tuberculous, have completed their uh, uh, anti-tuberculous treatments here, and then presented with ocular lesions. And of course, unless you do a biopsy in these patients, and several times a biopsy, again, this is not conclusive on these patients. There are patients who, who are suspected tuberculosis and uh, these patients have been sent for their um, uh, quantiferon tests and the quantiferon tests have turned out positive, but there is a large amount of false positive and false negatives in these particular cases. It's really difficult to say what exact percentage is going to be associated of systemic tuberculosis, which is going to be associated. And whether you need to start these patients on anti-tuberculous therapy just on the on per se of looking at an ocular lesion, then you are not sure of the diagnosis is something which is you would always want to debate upon. I think Dr. Biswas and Dr. Som Sheila can add on more on this. Yeah, 
I think is that tubercular scleritis is often a diagnostic challenge. I don't seeing it uh, scleritis. I cannot make out that it's a tubercular or non in or non in. I totally agree, sir. Yes. So there's some systemic investigation reports which may give us a clue. I don't think uh, that would uh, really make it a, a good clue because there may be a systemic infection and I can be having a different disease. Until unless you do it, it's tissue diagnosis. Yes, so I think it's a tissue diagnostic which is going to clinch and uh, uh, there are a lot of false positives. I think you will totally agree that several uh, you, the uh, quantiferon test is not always 100% conclusive of uh, tuberculosis. And, and in India, you would find most of us, you do a manto, you would find our mantles to be a little more about what is borderline and what is desirable here. So by and large, it is uh, in, in collaboration with your uh, system, with your physician, in collaboration with your ocular diagnostics, which is probably going to let you know whether you're going to start on antibacteria, on anti-tuberculous therapy for these patients. So Mshila, your views on these? Yeah, I would take the take up this question, the answer in two ways. The first is that, uh, as Dr. JBS so correctly pointed out, that there are two ways in which tuberculosis can be involved in scleritis. One is the uh, active or, or more of an infect, you know, when you have the actual tubercular bacteria, when you can isolate that from any of the ocular tissues, either by actually, if you have a abscess and you can isolate that, Dr. Yes. G has got it from the enucleated globe, or, or if you do PCR of any of the ocular uh, samples, and then that also comes positive. So that is a live bacterial infection of the eye. And that oh. is very rare, maybe in 2% of all the cases of infection, you might get that. The second and more, we presume, uh, commoner way of having tubercular related scleritis would be the immune mediated route or the hypersensitivity route. So this is when you have a patient who has maybe nodular scleritis and you've ruled out everything, the patient is not really improving to just uh, immunosuppressants alone. And then there's high elevated mantus and there is a maybe a, a positive, if you want to take quantiferon TB gold, we don't consider that if the mantis is highly elevated, then quantiferon TB gold is not really required. Or if you do an HRCT and there is something over there. So in that case, you can consider that this is a hypersensitivity re response to tuberculosis and you would start the patient on, on ADT and hope for a response. So these are the only two ways I think in which uh, you can, so it sometimes it turns out to be like a hindsight diagnosis. You think about it later on when everything else is not working in some cases. Or sometimes you systematically investigate the patient and you detect that. You're just by chance alone, you detect that on HRCT chest or something like that. And then you start the patient on treatment. Thank you. Dr. JB, what would you say? Anything else to oh, add? I, uh, it would be my, uh, after ruling out other things, then only right. I consider a TV. Right. That one, if that, I don't depend on the TB test coming positive only Absolutely. and then take, take, taking it as a TB. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Mahir is asking, how common is fungal scleritis in your practice? Okay, yeah. Um, see, when you have frank history of trauma with vegetable matter here, that is something where you would, uh, you would definitely be able to find out that's a fungal scleritis, a post-traumatic fungal scleritis. When you're doing therapeutic keratoplasties, when you're looking at that grave fungal infections which have spread up to the sclera, then you know these are patients where you have an associated fungal scleritis. Several times this tends to get missed at the time of diagnosis by the residents here, largely because you do these are uh, chronic cases, especially at our center. We do not jump in to do therapeutics very early. So you do have a lot of conjunctival injections which you see secondary to the the, the aggressive antifungal therapy itself here. So this would mask or this would lead to missing of an associated scleritis nodule here. So this is more common in cases where your infection is, um, is long drawn, it's chronic, and uh, you would find the patient coming to you with significant pain. So I, I always advise them to shift and look around, not just at the cornea here, it's very difficult to say how common. It's not really very common as because what you put in as infectious scleritis is, uh, is about close to 20% of your cases of what you see the infections is where you have scleritis is being associated. But when it's associated, then it becomes very difficult to treat them. 
and you will look for them specifically if you're finding recurrences after a well done, a well contained therapeutic keratoplasty here. And sometimes remember these organisms can remain indolent and they can show up even after a year, up to several months and a year after your primary successful surgery. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, when do you decide that you have to go for a scleroscraping, a patient with scleritis, not responding to? Yeah, so when you're having an active ulcerative lesion, necrotizing lesion, you can find a raw edge here. Then you could scrape out these patients here on the first presentation. And if you find that they are not responding to your medical therapy, if you, do, if you are starting on an empirical therapy, and you have a, 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 an abscess pointing here, then you can do an incision and drainage either under this red lamp itself, or you can do a, 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 an excision biopsy kind of, a, if it's a large nodule, which has been standing there for quite some time, it's increasing them, you can do it in your theater to take out tissue specimen here and send it for your diagnostics here. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for the excellent presentation. Uh, uh, we'll the next can talk. Can I ask one question to uh, Dr. Vanati? Yes, 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 Suji. Yeah, uh, yeah ma'am, uh, regarding this uh, nodular scleritis, uh, like uh, in cases of nodular scleritis, when you are uh, suspecting some uh, infectious etiology, when you go for a scleral biopsy, mm -hmm. uh, can you just uh, tell us a few points, like uh, how uh, you can do a scleral biopsy? It's quite different from, uh, a, we cannot uh, do a, a scleral biopsy so easily. Yeah, I, just, I, I, I really agree, I agree to you on this particular so doing a scleral biopsy is something which I also am not very uh, fond of doing here. But when you have an active pointing abscess here, you have an abscess which is you're able to clearly demarcate, you probably like to back it up with a diagnostics on your in an ASOCT or on your UBM earlier to look at the uh, or delineate the extents of the infections here. And uh, if you feel the abscess is amenable to an incision and drainage, a simple needle incision and drainage should be should suffice here. But if you find that's not possible, then you take it on to an OT and uh, you could do a simple uh, excision biopsy with a particular, avoid the necrotic areas and go in for a deep tissue specimen, something about four into four in both in your extent of X and Y axis and in the depth of the, of the lesion as well here. And uh, that's something where you can take out a tissue, tissue sample. If you have a delineated nodular lesions here, I think there are, there are incidences when uh, you could excise to an excision biopsy of your nodule as well here. So this is not very, something which I do very commonly most of the time. So it's either a scleral scraping for a smear or an incision and drainage or a nodule uh, or a nodule biopsy, which could be an excision biopsy in total once you're able to delineate the extents of the infection and uh, you're also sure that you're not worsening if you're not planning a subsequent patch around it. I usually don't plan a patch unless you have your diagnostics in hand because that's going, not going to result in good success of your patch if you're not backing it up with good antimicrobial therapy. The main um, worries will be about uh, the thinning the cornea which is I mean got, uh, the scleral area or the nodule. If you have a large nodule which is yeah. probably not decreasing, it's increasing there. And that is where you could safely go in and do an, an excision biopsy here. But if there's extensive thinning, then you would contain your thinning with your, uh, then you would contain your, inf uh, your inflammation, look at your uh, microbiology back up here, and then take in for a surgical management with a tectonic touch. Uh, the, my question is relevant in, uh, uh, actually, uh, I have a patient in which I believe it is not uh, uh, infectious. Uh, okay. There's no pointing. Um, there's uh, actually in, uh, there is a uh, two nodules mm -hmm. which for more than six months and which is refractory to all almost all the treatment. And uh, he has been extensively worked up for a TV also, but like uh, what we have all discussed, like manto, uh, chest X-ray, CT, everything is negative, mm -hmm. and you have, uh, even the ESR is also um, very um, it's nine or ten or something. So there is absolutely no clue for tuberculosis as of now. Okay. So, uh, and he's not having any systemic autoimmune uh, disorders also. All the workup is so far negative. So the next, um, I've been suggested, like, can we go for a um, scleral biopsy? So I really worry if I touch that sclera, which is inflamed nodule, mm -hmm. am I going to create more problems for that patient or what? No, not much. So I can go for a, a scleral yeah. biopsy. 
Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes. I think that is the only thing which is because that's the only diagnostic which you right now have because you've come to a dead end where you probably do not know which way to go in terms of management. You've exhausted everything, and uh, if you're not sure if it is an immune one, then um, starting steroids could worsen if if it's an infectious etiology. And you see that you have cases where they have syphilis positive patients which would present as nodules. You can have leprosy patients, though these are very rare. You can have trypanosomal infections here, which can also present as nodules. Yeah. So these are some things which you still can't rule out on uh, investigations, and you probably will need a biopsy. The patient, because he has already completed one round of uh, one round of uh, uh, steroids, methotrexate, mycophenolate, mm -hmm. uh, okay. and he has completed. All, all courses and now he has uh, come to a stage where uh, I mean uh, the rheumatologist is planning uh, uh, some uh, biological agents like adalimumab and uh, before that he would like to me uh, have a little biopsy. Okay, so you still look does the patient is the patient symptomatic? Still, he is having a dull ache, a dull pain, and uh, the eye looks slightly. Um, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, it looks slightly knocked almost uh, slightly. And, and you mentioned that there are two nodules. Is that right? Yes, yeah, that's what he said. Look at it. I don't have the picture. I actually wanted to show the picture just for a, uh, a diagnostic picture, not for the full case. But I couldn't uh, retrieve it. Uh, it's just two nodules, uh, left eye infrotemporal. And it is there for more than six months. And as I told, and he has already completed all these uh, treatments, like uh, uh, all the workup also. Nothing so far positive. Extensive what is his immune diagnosis? What what is the diagnosis which a rheumatologist has placed for him? No, he, I, I, he, the rheumatologist has uh, worked up uh, completely extensively. All the possible uh, tests has been done, and nothing, nothing has nothing come has out. has come out possible. Yes, okay. just uh, after ruling out tuberculosis by routine methods like Manto and all those things, uh, he had just uh, he started on methotrexate, which didn't show any. Uh, he started on steroids, but uh, his uh, blood sugars uh, uh, got elevated. So and then uh, reduced the, the dose of the steroids and started on uh, methotrexate, but still no difference. And uh, then switched on to mycophenolate, no difference. Now I think he is planning for biological agent actually. So I still believe, sir, uh, in such cases, uh, that a tissue diagnosis could give some clue for uh, tuberculosis, right? It may not yes. be picking up from the routine test, actually. But if because the patient is not very symptomatic, I will not go for biopsy. He is symptomatic, sir. He is so then you can go ahead for the biopsy before putting him on biologic. Uh, I didn't get you, sir. If, if you want to put him on biologics, that would be yes. if it's a tubercular infection or any infectious process, that would be really uh, very harmful for the patient. Because if he's harboring some foci of tuberculosis. So uh, you, you feel it is better to do the biopsy first and yes, then go for biologics. If you have exhausted all the other investigations, it would be going for a biopsy. So biopsy would show the collection of lymphocytes and uh, uh, that if you see the granuloma, it would go in favor mm -hmm. of tuberculosis. Dr. Sujit, one thing I've learned the hard way is that if a patient of scleritis who you think is immune-mediated scleritis, does not improve with oral steroids, then that patient is not going to improve with oral immunomodulators. So with, if you give a full dose of oral steroids for three, four weeks and there's no change, it means that we're on the wrong track. That's so true. the differential diagnosis for these would be, we could be looking at viral inflammation or we could be looking at other infections like mycobacterium as was discussed, or it could be a masquerade like Vanati had pointed out yes, or, yes. Some, or a benign kind of a nodular lesion also. So three to four weeks is almost, I think everybody would agree, uh, Dr. JB, that if you start the patient on adequate steroids and if there's nothing, no change, then it means that we're on the wrong track. Yeah, we I just, think I, uh, yeah, try yeah, with I, immunosuppressive agents also. I yeah. I'll go in a one more step. Yeah. Right. But it depends. Maybe you had some initial yeah. response. Yeah, I think I would agree with uh, Dr. Somshila on that, that uh, almost uh, most of the immune uh, scleritis, you would find uh, a good response because you do tend to bombard them systemically with extensive uh, steroid therapy in these cases here. 
And when you do not find a response, you probably are looking at uh, other causes of, of scleritis and it's probably not an immune case here. And uh, as she rightly pointed out, you have a significant amount of viral cases which could cause scleritis as well. And uh, identification is, is going to be really difficult in if it's going to be a viral uh, scleritis here. And mycobacteria, again, uh, it's not that if you do a tissue biopsy, you're going to get it out on a, on a tissue biopsy in these cases. You probably will be able to find some amount of inflammation. You might able, land up with finding an inconclusive evidence even after doing a, a biopsy in these cases. The chances of that is going to be quite high, especially after you've given a, such an extensive course of immune modulating agents for the patient. So it's really not going to be diagnostic. You probably will not be able to find a, a mycobacterial organism which you'll be able to culture or take out on a PCR after you've treated for such a long period of time. So these are some factors which you'll probably keep at the back of your mind and you still might land up being inconclusive. And I would probably look at alternative therapies, like if you're looking at a viral, you could look at nocardial infections here, it could be trypanomal infections. And mind you, several of these would probably occur without a systemic pointer in these cases. So you probably would like to change your course of medications when you look at these patients. But I agree, it's a very difficult case on your hands. Uh, I, I feel that if you're a patho on the pathologist's point of view, I would be able to uh, lean towards the diagnosis of tuberculosis looking at the histopathology. Okay. If we see that uh, epithelioid cells, histiocytes over there, mm -hmm. I will, uh, or for formation of giant cells, uh, I will, or a KZH and necrosis, mm -hmm. I would be able to go towards the tuberculosis and then I will uh, do a PCR uh, for mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA. Okay. and then clinch the diagnosis. Yes. Okay, uh, moving on. Shall we, we go can to the move next talk? Yeah, we'll move on to this next talk. Uh, now that we have seen uh, the varied clinical presentations of both non-infectious and infectious scleritis, it is very important that we follow certain rules and guidelines in our day-to-day -day OPD practice so that we do not miss out any causative factor inadvertently. And to help us with that, we have with us today, Dr. Somshila Murthy. Dr. Somshila completed her fellowship in cornea from LV Prasad Eye Institute. She has also obtained fellowship in UVA to synocular pathology from Dohinia Institute. She has to her credit over 100 publications in peer reviewed international journals and has served as the principal investigator in over 20 clinical trials. As an acknowledgement of her achievements, she, she was awarded the Achievement Award by the American Academy of Ophthalmology. She has been working as a full-time faculty at LB Prasad Eye Institute for the past 19 years and she also heads the Cornea Fellowship Program at LB Prasad Eye Institute. I invite Dr. Somshila Murthy to give her presentation on practical guidelines to be followed in the management of scleritis. Thank you very much, Dr. Mihir. At the onset, I would like to thank KOS and Dr. Sujit, uh, as well as Dr. Dalia and Dr. Vijayalakshmi for having me as one of the speakers. Uh, I'm in very august company. And uh, today we are talking about trying to tame the fire, which is scleritis. So these, uh, Dr. JB, coincidentally, when I put this slide, so these are my who I can to my teachers, they may not directly taught me, some have, but some are my teachers and my well-wishers mentors. So everybody probably knows or should know Professor Narsing Rao, who's pretty much the mentor for many of us. And of course, Dr. Biswas, I've learned so much uh, either directly or indirectly from his publications. Dr. Sagan is my mentor and friend and guide uh, who was with us at Elvi Prasad, now he's moved to, to Delhi. Dr. Amod Gupta, again, passive learning by all his teachings and Dr. Ratinam, who's a very good friend of mine, as well as just an amazing, uh, uh, passionate lady of UVI. So I just wanted to acknowledge all my teachers today because it's a special day being a uh, day of Indian independence. And, and I'm happy that I'm part of this meeting. So coming to the way I am, I'm, I'm a surgeon. I have a very practical approach. I cut and send off. And I also train under pathology. So I cut and send it off to me. I try to look at it, the pathology as well. So it's a two-edged two thing, but I'm just going to uh, help you or lead you how to manage these cases. What is a practical way of managing these cases? We had two wonderful presentations. Half my work is very easy now because Dr. JB talked about immune-mediated scleritis in great detail and Dr. 
Varati talked about infectious characters. So you got a pretty good overview of what kind of diseases you're supposed to look at. Now, how do you approach these cases? So in order for each and every one of you to approach these cases, I think the first question you should ask yourself is that in your practice, whether it's institute-based or, or your own clinic-based or, or multi-specialty, how frequently do you see these patients in your clinic? Because scleritis itself is pretty rare in the population. And if you're in a general ophthalmology practice, you may not see them really very frequently. Supposing you are able to answer question one, then the second is that how confident would you be in managing this disease? Uh, do you have access to good lab facility for systemic investigations? It, this is very important because you have to have a reliable lab, even PPD, all the simplest of investigation you think they should be done reliably. So do you have access to good microbiology and histopathology facility? And microbiology is very important because of the infectious colitis load that you're going to see. And then lastly, but not the least, so we, it's, it's, it's really wonderful that we have rheumatology colleague here for this meeting. And do you have availability or accessibility to these colleagues who will understand you? You pick up the phone and tell them that I have a patient who has scleritis. Can you just see what's their systemic? I mean, isn't that very vague for the rheumatologist? But they're very understanding and they really help us out in managing these patients. So if you have your entire set ready, so it's like having the entire instrument set for a surgery. You have to have everything ready before you go in and operate. So if you have this entire set ready, then you may be ready for the for, for managing these patients, and that's the purpose of my talk. So the first question is that how frequently do you see scleritis in your clinic? Maybe it's very rare because, as I told you, that in the general population itself is very rare. But it's still you should at least all of you we know that how to diagnose this. But it's not just diagnosing it. We should be able to figure out which one is immune mediated versus infectious, which is anterior diffuse kind of scleritis versus the posterior scleritis. Uh, or is it a necrotizing scleritis because as Dr. JB said, that has more systemic implications versus a non-necrotizing scleritis. So it may be rare, but you should be able to diagnose these various entities. The second point that I had is that if, it's, if you're not really going to manage the cases, at least you should know in which cases, what is the initial management? So if it's an infectious scleritis, you recognize that. Do you know the appropriate antimicrobial that you would like to start? If it's uh, maybe a diffuse anterior scleritis, you can at least start the patient on topical uh, NSAIDs or topical steroids, oral NSAIDs, and then refer the patient across. So you can refer it to either to an institute or to a colleague of yours who you know who deals with such cases. Because of the rarity of the disease, it's best to send either get trained very well or to send them to a colleague who's used to managing these cases because they would have seen many more and they would figure out maybe better than us. For example, I never touch patients with glaucoma or any other specialty except mine because I've lost touch with those cases. So if on the other hand, you either often or frequently see these patients or you have like me, like a passion to know about these cases and how to manage them, or you may be working in a remote place and the patient cannot travel. So you are the doctor for them. You're the only specialist for them. So these in this, in these instances, you really need to know about these particular cases and you need to know how to tame this fire. So because I saw in the chat box about episcleral inflammation, I just put up this slide. So episcleral, episcleritis, as Dr. J.D. or the previous speakers mentioned, is the more benign cousin of scleritis. And you know that there is just an irritation. There isn't any real pain when you add an elephant to the eye and the entire layer that you can see here on the slide on your right is going to disappear like this. So in, in our mind, it's it's not at all a side threatening disease or a destructive disease that the patient may have, but for the patient, it's very bothersome. And some of these cases can have systemic uh, vasculitic or connective tissue diseases in association. Some of them can have local uh, conditions around the eye itself. And as I mentioned, it's not associated with visual loss. So would you investigate them? Probably most of the time, because whatever experience we have, that majority of these investigations turn out to be negative. So I would say in the first few episodes, I kind of don't investigate them. I may perform investigations similar to scleritis cases if the patient has a cycle of continuous episodes of episcleritis or has something else that is systemically uh, pointing towards a, a disease entity that is associated with scleritis. And then somebody asked about management. So how do you manage them? Typically, uh, just about any of these drugs you can choose. You can choose a topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. 
you can choose a low potent steroid or you can choose a potent steroid even if the congestion is is more severe and just like what they say about uh, many things in life that you repeat as required so the patient finishes up with the treatment may come back later on so you give the minimum amount of treatment that gets rid of the condition for you and only in those multiple recurrent cases where may or may not have something systemic there you might resort to an oral immunomodulator so far for episcleritis i've not used for even for a single case ever most of the time it they get yeah. settled with this and it might disappear so that was about episcleritis just a little bit coming back to the to the meat of the topic is how to proceed in a case of scleritis so the four or five things you need, i would look at is the anatomical diagnosis the age and gender of the patient how severe is the disease and is there a systemic component are you suspecting it or is there already a systemic component yes or no so this is the classic uh, cl uh, this is a very very uh, robust classification still relevant although it was published in 1976 for immune mediated scleritis we divided it as anterior and posterior and as dr jb already mentioned that so i need not go through it but just to say that the most common variety that you might see as a general ophthalmologist would be or even in the clinic for that like, for that matter would be an anterior scleritis most of more often you would probably see a non necrotizing type and a diffuse variant and this is kind of the the best case scenario that you would like to have so that's about anatomical diagnosis being diffuse anterior more common followed by nodular necrotizing and posterior scleritis as dr jb highlighted posterior scleritis is very very underdiagnosed so how to proceed if it's the diffuse anterior th these cases are the best in terms of responding to treatment and you have you can be a little bit uh, less on aggression in, in treating them and you have a choice of of varying your selection uh, whether you want to add immunomodulators or not or maybe you can just treat this first episode and see what happens after you investigate the patient in nodular you can expect that it will be slightly more resistant to initial therapy you can expect recurrences so your antenna for starting immunomodulators would be on the higher side Necrosis, necrotizing you know that there is a highest chance of systemic component association and here you will be aggressive in starting therapy maybe even collaborate with the rheumatologist in posterior scleritis the systemic component maybe it's lesser based on published studies but you do need aggressive treatment perhaps because it may be diagnosed a little bit later all right coming to the age and gender so why is this important is that when it's gender certain diseases have a predilection as dr uh, Uh, JB mentioned that he's never seen a case of SLE, but with scleritis. But it does; they've reported it, so it probably does exist. And obviously, that would be in a female patient, not in a male patient. So the investigations also you would expect patients with rheumatoid arthritis slightly more female uh, preponderance. Obviously, the anchor positivity for uh, GPA would be more, slightly more male preponderance, and ANA positivity would be more in female. So that's the importance of gender. in terms of age you might have two spectrums so to speak of age in scleritis one is that the youngish to middle aged patient and the second is that the older patient the elderly patient so the investigations and management would be a little different in both these cases for example if an 80 year old presents with scleritis and everything else is absolutely fine for the patient so by the time if the patient had a systemic disease it would have manifested by now so i would be less likely to investigate uh, i would investigate but i would i would know that the pre test probability of finding something systemic is would be on the lower side in fact i would be a little bit worried that the patient should not have something like a mastery and also not only the 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 etiology but also my management again in the elderly i would be less gung ho about using something like cyclophosphamide or or long term oral steroids for these patients whereas in the younger patient i would be a little bit more aggressive in treating them especially if it's necrotizing so that was about age and you might just have the pediatric patient pediatric scleritis is is very rare but it's not unknown and you can have a few cases presenting with with in the pediatric age group and here you want to avoid oral steroids or at least prolong prolonged use of oral steroids at all costs not to interfere with the growth cycle and here sometimes you might want to resort to immunomodulators much earlier on or even to biologicals to just to do away with the need for oral steroids and investigation also would be slightly different for these patients so when i'm talking about investigations let's talk about when 
investigations in episcleritis, at least my personal preference and whatever I read of literature is that you may not investigate. Maybe only if it's persistent or recurrent, you can investigate. Having said that, I can't recall if I got it, if I detected a new case of a systemic disease with episcleritis. I know that I've had patients with, with the disease like rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's disease come in with episcleritis, but I have not detected a new disease in a patient. So I don't know if, uh, if I'm, I'm a little reluctant to do any investigations for them. Then what about scleritis? As Dr. JV mentioned, all scleritis, not just the bilateral scleritis. Also very, very important for necrotizing scleritis. If it's unilateral necrotizing, think, think a little bit about infection also. Keep that in the back of your mind because it could look like a necrotizing scleritis, but it could actually be necrosis due to infection. So which investigations? So a very simple screening tool. Now this depends on if you're the only doctor for the patient and that sort of story, or the patient uh, and you can't send the patient anywhere else, or it also depends on you know, whether you want to do certain investigations for, for like, like a baseline, which anyway will be done. So you're not wasting the patient's money and it helps you understand and treat the patient better. So we typically do just like a screening evaluation with some of these investigations. And this, the most important ones which I've highlighted the rheumatoid arthritis factor, the ANCAs and ANA also we tend to do. So here's a result of a patient with uh, ANA positivity, uh, which then you have an extended ANA profile. So this I was actually putting up to ask the rheumatologist later on. So what is the significance of ANA? Because I've heard many rheumatologists say that it really it doesn't matter. It's only a test for uh, more towards SLE. Whereas uh, we see a lot of ANA positivity and ANA vasculitis kind of positivity not just in scleritis, but many of our dry eye patients and even in mucous membrane pemphigoid. So really we need to know what is the importance of ANA. And uh, uh, Vanati mentioned about syphilis. So, and we are more and more sensitive now. So in, in our initial screening panel, we also include a TPHA test because it, if you can pick up that rare case of syphilis, which is so treatable. So, and you don't want to use steroids for them. And most of our patients, because we know eventually we're going to put them on oral steroids and immunomodulators, we always start off with the baseline PPD, X-ray chest, and those kind of investigations. Not that we're suspecting tuberculosis in them, but just for our management of these patients. So co coming to the what, so what needs to be investigated? So all scleritis, as I mentioned, diffuse anterior unilateral scleritis, as I mentioned, and necrotizing scleritis, where you're more likely to get these investigations positive. So don't be disappointed or don't be surprised if the other scleritis, which is a good 60-70% of scleritis, would be negative for ANCA, ANA, or RA. So that's what you're likely to have in the community. Whereas you will again not be surprised when you see that the necrotizing scleritis person ha may have seropositivity for these investigations. So that is what you that is what you expect for these patients. So you, if you're doing the investigation, then it's, it's typically our headache to figure out how do you interpret raised ESR and elevated CRP. A lot of ophthalmologists give a lot of importance to this, but uh, don't read the lab test. So if the, if just because the CRP is elevated, that doesn't mean that you have to increase your immunosuppression for these patients. It, act, it, it may mean that it's still elevated, but you have to go based on the clinical response of the patient then you can have ANCA levels which may uh, initially be positive and later negative, so that's a good thing. But also remember that even if you have negative ANCA, but the clinical pictures, necrotizing scleritis with PUK or something like that, that is so classical for GPA in other instances. So you can still have an, what we call, the rheumatologists may not agree, but we can still have an ocular form of GPA where the ANCA can be negative. And along with RA, also you can do an anti-cyclic uh, citrullated peptide antibody as well. All right, and these are the add-on investigations which the uh, rheumatologists would definitely get done for us. In, in certain cases, you can have HLA B27 positive scleritis and the B5, 51, 51 and 52 also can be done. In case of viral suspicion, you need to do other investigations, not serology. You might want to take a specimen for PCR from somewhere from the lesion. And in case of positive mantus, you might want to uh, push the patient towards getting, if possible, an HRCT done to see what's happening. So in other words, if you want to classify the investigations, the first bunch of investigations here are for managing the patient. So these, will, these are not really for, it's not like I'm suspecting that the patient has tuberculosis or something. 
but it's because I'm going to manage the patients. The patients may go on to long-term immunomodulators and or maybe even biologicals and depending on the disease and how it responds. So this is for managing the patient. The second set of investigations are, which I've listed most of them, are what you might help you in labeling the disease. So an etiological classification like RA positive, patient may not have rheumatoid arthritis, but you might label it as RA positive scleritis, or you might label it as ANCA positive scleritis, or it may be a GPA if the patient has some systemic component. If not, you label it as ANCA positive scleritis. So this is help, helping us to understand that this could be the possible etiology for these patients. And the last part, the second part is for us as ophthalmologists is very important is the local investigations. Dr. JB and Vanati, both of them talked about the anterior segment OCT and I also use it just like them. Uh, earlier having used UBM, now many of us have shifted to OCT. UBM still has its utility, especially in infections where you can see the infection, how far backward is it going? And of course, B scan for posterior scleritis. And based on whether you're suspecting infection, as we already discussed, we need microbiological workup. In, in masquerades, we might want to get an impression cytology first. And we've just talked about scleral biopsy for these cases that, especially that rather very confusing case and, and a tough case that Dr. Sujit has shared with us. And we have learned for the past few years now is that uh, herpes group of viruses can much more frequently cause scleritis than we thought possible. And in a patient who does not respond to, which looks like scleritis, uh, you know, immune mediated, but does not respond, as responds initially, but beyond a point does not respond to topical, to oral therapy of steroids, then think of viral. And I, we simply start a therapeutic trial of antivirals and we see the response. And sometimes you, you get success over there. And this is exactly one such case. So this patient is a 44 year old male with two, two months history of pain and redness. So one very important piece of history, which my fellow missed was that there was a lesion on the forehead. The patient himself did not remember that two months back that there was something that was going on. And uh, so this is the anterior segment OCT. Uh, it doesn't, looking at it, it doesn't tell you that this is uh, infectious, viral, or it doesn't give you etiology. But what it does tell you is that this is a, this is a, a, a conjunctival area. There are some dilated vessels here. And most of it shows that there's a lot of thickening. So it's much more than the clinical picture. So the, because of the, the, derm, the pigmented lesion on the forehead, we label this condition as uh, zoster-related scleritis. And in this picture, you can also see these peripheral faint corneal lesions. So these are lesions because later on they disappeared when we started the patient on therapy. So these are faint corneal lesions here. And this is after starting the patient on uh, oral uh, asacrid with 800 milligrams five times a day. So this is what I'm trying to show in the arrows. And this was a few weeks later. Already you can see that there is some change in the OCT and these dilated vessels have, have become more split-like. They have kind of decreased and the scleral inflammation is still there. But subsequently, as you move further in time, even this will subside. So this is a patient of viral and complete resolution of the condition after using antivirals and topical corticosteroids, but the patient is still on follow-up. This is another such case. It's not viral. It was immune-mediated scleritis. At, at entry, you'd see that it doesn't look like there's much of is swelling or thickening of the sclera. But when you do the OCT, if a normal thickness here should be less than 700 microns, here is about 1.08. So definitely thickened and abnormal architecture and all these dilated vessels. And when the patient is put on oral steroids and later was also on immunomodulators, you see that nearly, uh, it's a month later, there's a, the at least architecture is getting stabilized. There is still some thickening and this will increase, this will get better further with and this is down the line as you move for the same patient, maybe two or three months later. So coming quickly to the medical management, and this is a very good article that was published way back in 2008 by John, Professor John Kempen and group. They, gave, they talked about step ladder pattern, and I'm going to elaborate on this in my next slide. All right, so the first line therapy for scleritis, especially the simpler ones, like I said, the diffuse anterior scleritis, has been described as oral uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication as well as plus minus topical steroids. Actually, topical steroids is not there. It's, I've added that. So uh, having said that, most of the time, maybe the kind of patients that come to us to institute, uh, they just don't seem to respond to this alone. So most of the time I start this, get the investigations done. And when the investigations come back, typically I would have gone to line to second line. 
So let's assume that this worked for the patient and there may be some minor recurrences for this patient. You've investigated, of course, and nothing was there. And so you can tide over the recurrences with either local, just topical steroids or subconjunctival or transeptal, but you have to be very careful about these agents. And again, you can start the patient on oral NSAIDs for minor recurrences. Now, let's say that the patient improved, that's just great. But if there's a therapeutic failure, so that then we have to go on to second line treatment. Second line treatment is systemic steroids. But honestly, most of the patients that we see at maybe at Institute, I don't know, Vanity and Dr. JB could tell, most of the patients are the ones we straight away start with second line. In our hands, first line is not there. We don't see the patients so early, I guess. So if we're very lucky, then the patient will just uh, improve with systemic steroids dramatically. And they do improve dramatically. The problem, the trick is when you take off the systemic steroids and what happens. And you use it for a short enough while adequate and then the patient just goes into remission and you can just maintain on either oral NSAIDs or topical NSAIDs and repeat this part as well. If there are minor recurrences, you can just go local therapy, especially in COVID times, you don't want to use a whole lot of systemic therapy for these patients. So going local is better. Now, what if systemic steroids you've used and either it didn't work enough or it worked, but the minute you went on tapering, then there was therapeutic failure. Then you need to go to third line. And third line is nothing but our immunomodulators. And these are uh, several drugs like methotrexate is what we use the most. MMF is also used, uh, Dr. JB, I guess, uses it more than we do. And then you might, if it's necrotizing some patients, we have to, we have to induce them on cyclophosphamide. And these are the other drugs that are also used as well as sometimes a combination if one drug is not working that well. But honestly, we start off with systemic steroids and many of our patients are also on methotrexate and whenever they have minor recurrences, I usually treat them with a transeptal injection. Or if they're very severe, most of our, because our patients are slightly not affording, we have to, we're forced to induce them with cyclophosphamide. And if the, all this doesn't work, then we still have one more weapon, and that is the fourth line. So fourth line includes the biologics and now the JAK inhib inhibitors. There is some published studies on this latest one. But these are the biological agents of which many of us are using adalimumab as well as rituximab. The others I have no experience with, but these are the two agents that we've been using. In those recalcitrant agents where everything else has failed or is not adequate, or you cannot use some of these agents like say pediatric patient, you don't want to use too much of systemic steroids and methotrexate is not adequate, or, or you don't want to use cyclophosphamide because of its side effects of sterility and so on. So sometimes you will have to resort to fourth line of therapy. So I hope that that was a very crowded slide. I hope I could make it clear. And this is one of our patients, which ultimately the patient is being followed up by Dr. JB because we tried our best to improve her. Uh, she just wouldn't get better and so dependent on oral steroids of at least 30 milligrams per day, despite- This, this patient from Nellor, no? That's right, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so finally we even gave her rituximab. Uh, I think we gave it one infusion or two infusions and then Dr. JB took over and I think uh, he's been managing her since and she somehow seems to be doing okay now, I guess. So that was an example of where we used rituximab for just probably the first or second patient that we used it. And that's why I was interested to talk about this case. So uh, we talked about patch graph, Vanati talked about that. And this, these are some of the cases of patch graphs that we have done. Even the patch graph can undergo melt, if you like this example here, if you don't immunosuppress the patient. So the patient at least has to receive, if you need to do a patch graph, it means that we are really, really in big trouble. And you at least have to immunosuppress the patient giving, uh, typically we'll give pulse IV and P and as well as cyclophosphamide and then take up the patient a couple, the same day or next day or as, as, as feasible based on the logistics and the workup of the patient. So here's one such patient where you can see that there's a very large area which is tectonically not stable. And what I've done is hand fashioned a piece of sclera after removing all the conjunctiva around it. And uh, this patient uh, was having necrotizing scleritis, but we couldn't detect anything systemic for the patient. And then after putting this, uh, after initially fixing with some sutures, uh, subsequently you can put in fibrin glue and stick the rest of it. So that's made things easier for us. You don't need to put a whole lot of sutures also, although here I have. And I've just trimmed it down. It's a very old video. Uh, and finally, uh, on top of this, you cannot leave the skeletal tissue bare because the edges will cause the tear film instability. And there'll be, uh, as a consequence, there'll be, there'll be 
multiple problems due to that. So what you can do is simply harvest uh, Kanjitawa as an autograft, and you can even put tenons on it. Uh, I mean, there's no, no problem in putting tenons on it actually. And harvest that and stick the Kanjitawa with, with fibrin glue onto this area. So this patient actually did very, very well after the patch draft. Maybe we were lucky and we used, uh, we just used aggressive immunosuppression for this patient. And she's been on regular follow-up and the entire graft has literally um, sort of taken up by the eye. You can't even make out that there's a graft over there. But sometimes you don't have this luck. And this is another example of a patient who had a known case of vaginous granulomatosis or GPA. And we did a patch graft, but came back with melting of the patch graft. And that was because the patient had stopped everything due to COVID times. So already Dr. Vanity has covered infections extensively. What I wanted to cover, if uh, uh, Dr. Sujit or Dr. Shah, if I'm going way over time, I can stop. No, ma'am, we can continue. Okay. So just to mention that the infectious scleritis roots can be exogenous either by surgery or trauma. So I had typed in the chat box, these are the top two uh, instances or, or history where, again, I would think first of uh, infection. And the second is that there can be extension from adjacent infections, exactly as Dr. Vanity pointed out, like for example, in fungal scleritis, keratitis. And lastly, you can have endogenous, just like you have endogenous endophthalmitis, you can have septicemia and seeding, seeding of the bacteria or whatever organism in the sclera just end, it's an end organ. So in the sclera, it just gets seeded over there. It's a varying incidence based on literature and we reported from our series, almost 17.8 or 18% were infections actually, it was pretty high. And, but that's what we see at our series. And there's a patient who had passed in a vitrectomy and you can see this white slough at the base of the vitrectomy ports. So it's not a case of surgical induced necrotizing scleritis, which was the initial diagnosis. But when you took scrapings from here, it turned out to be a case of no cardiac scleritis. And that was only because of microbiology. Looking at it, you can't say what infection it is. And Dr. Vanati also mentioned that just about everything under the sun can cause infectious scleritis. So it's good that somebody asked the question about fungus. The fungus is not the commonest. Just because you have a history of trauma with vegetative matter doesn't mean that you get fungal infection although fungal infection is, is probably one of the single most common organism. But if you club all the bacteria together, you're almost 75% of the times you're going to hit bacteria and only 25% of the times you're going to hit fungus. So therefore it's better as empirical treatment, even if there's history of trauma with, uh, with vegetative matter to start the patient on empirical antibiotics first, if you're not taking, if you're not resort, if you don't have access to microbiology. Because the second problem with starting empirical antifungals is that it takes a very long time to respond, at least a week before you see response. So if you start antibiotics, you would expect a response in 48 hours. So that is the turnaround time for because you have bactericidal agents. So that's another advantage of using antibacterial as empirical treatment. But at, but at our institute, we don't believe in empirical treatment. We always take the patient for scleral biopsy it could be the deroofing or, or deep scrapings from that area because we know that taking in the office just a aspirate doesn't yield much. And there's so many instances where you missed the organism and lost time also. So right from when the patient comes in with, with what looks like infectious scleritis, the patient is uh, scheduled maybe the same day or next day for a deep scraping. And I'm going to show you one such case. And just to complete the list includes viruses, even acanthabiba, as Vanati has already mentioned, as well as parasites. So this was a patient who had a, um, a exactly the question that was asked about how do you do a biopsy of this nodule. So this patient had uh, this no history of trauma or any antecedent surgery, but presented with this scleral nodule, which obviously is infected. So here you don't need to wonder whether this is in what is it infectious or mediated because it's pus filled. It's obvious that this is a purulent lesion uh, and the patient did have severe pain. So what I'm trying to do is trying to remove, excise the entire um, nodule in total. You Honestly, you don't have to do that, but because of the pathology background, just wanted the entire specimen. But anyway, it, so this specimen will be cut into half and half of it will go to microbiology, cultured in various to be cultured in various media and the other half to pathology. And what, so of course, all of these cases, there is a lot of bleeding and you just have to ignore that or have a good assistant mop for you or, or pour uh, ringer lactate for you. 
But what I missed out here in this video is that the bed is where you're more likely to, the bed and the advancing edges is where you're more likely to get the organisms from. So the scrapings should be, after you exercise the nodule, the scraping should also be taken from the bed. And leave that conjunctiva open. Do not put a scleral graft or anything like that, or, a, or a, don't cover it up. Because it's just like principles of any abscess drainage that you need to leave it open for access of the micro or access of the microbial, antimicrobial into that area because sclera has a very poor penetration. So, so don't bother to put the conjunctiva back in place. You're going to impede the uh, agents to reach that particular site. And, and I'm always amazed at, in spite of what looks like a very bloody surgery, and in spite of what I think that the patient will have pain and so on, I'm always amazed at how the pain goes down for the patient as you, after you do scleral de-roofing or scleral biopsy for infections. And that is simply because of similar to the abscess principle that you are getting rid of the infectious material for the patient. And the patient always even works as a little bit therapeutic also. You can irrigate this bed with either with betadine, you can keep flushing it with betadine that takes care of both bacteria or fungus or based on if you have some initial microbiology, you can use either antimicrobial or antifungal based if you have a clinical clue of what's happening. So I think I will end here because this is a very long discussion on infection. Uh, just to say that I was uh, fortunate enough to, uh, to write up on infectious scleritis and uh, the, the flow chart of how to differentiate between infectious and various other differential diagnoses, which is what is hidden here under these blocks, uh, will be coming up in IGO, coming up in the next issue will be entirely on ocular inflammation anyway, and scleritis. And in the infectious scleritis, you can go through this flow chart which will help you uh, sort of give you some steps on how to go further. So to conclude that uh, immune mediated is rare and we've understood that oral steroids are necessary, but for initially treating the patient well, but you have to maintain them on immunomodulators and the newer agents are there for the refractory ca cases. I always collaborate with the new rheumatologist most of the time, unless for logistics, the patient just cannot go. And any surgical therapy that you plan, there has to be adequate or aggressive immunosuppression. And we also, just like Vanity mentioned, we have burnt our fingers with masquerades. So just watch out for those masquerades. She's mentioned already that you have myriad organisms causing infection. But if you have patients with trauma and previous surgery and debilitating systemic disease, think more likely that it may be infection rather than immune mediated. Microbiological identification is paramount. If you don't do that, you just don't know what to do next. So you must, must have a good lab to help you with this. Surgical debridement works both for microbiology as well as as a therapy. And then once you have these two things in place, you can start the appropriate microbiome. Thank you so much for listening to me for a very long presentation. And I apologize for that. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for that systematic approach and that uh, step ladder management pattern. I think uh, all of us have got a clear idea how to manage a case of scleritis. Um, I think uh, we'll go to the... Uh, few questions to be asked to uh, Dr. Anu first, and then we'll come back to the questions, ma'am. Sure. Dr. Mahir? So, yeah, uh, we also have with us today a well-renowned uh, rheumatologist, Dr. Anuf, to share with us his perspective in the management of scleritis. Uh, Dr. Anuf uh, did his postdoctoral fellowship in rheumatology and clinical immunology at CMC Vellore and uh, also his international fellowship in rheumatology from uh, Norfolk and Norwich University Hospitals, UK. Currently, he's the medical director and chief uh, rheumatologist at uh, Dr. Uh, Anoop's Rheumacare, uh, West Hill, which is in Calicut, and a visiting consultant at uh, Aston Mims Hospital, Calicut and Cotacan. Uh, on behalf of Coricord of Thundic Society, I, want, I once again extend a hearty welcome to Dr. Anoop. Uh, I request Dr. Dahlia uh, to put forward to him certain common questions uh, that we as ophthalmologists like to get answered from him uh, regarding the management of associated uh, systemic conditions in scleritis. Dr. Dahlia. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Dr. Anouf. Uh, as uh, all the panelists uh, said that how important the systemic investigation is in, in the case of scleritis. So, and we need in many cases, as 50% of do have a systemic cause, we need a rheumatologist's opinion on the same. So what we wanted to know is what are the 
pre investigations you do before starting immunosuppressive treatment? Dr. Anu, are you there? Dr. Anu? Uh, so yeah, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, can you hear me right now? Yeah, so what yeah, are the tests you do before you start a treatment on treatment yeah. immunosuppressive? Yeah, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, all the organizers of this fantastic meeting. Uh, uh, Dr. Siddhartha and Dr. Dali and uh, Dr. Mahir for that fantastic uh, introduction. So, uh, uh, when I also used to see, I uh, used to get reference from uh, uh, most of these from the ophthalmologists regarding uh, the management of this uh, immune mediated influenza disorders. So, uh, coming to the investigation part, um, the first of, first of all, I would like I, I would uh, I would tell you, I would like to mentioned that uh, by default, uh, when we see the cases like this, we always think that most of these infectious problems are actually caused by uh, this one, uh, as much as possible, caused by ophthalmologists and uh, getting most of the time a non-infectious problem. Uh, if, uh, if, you look, if you take uh, uh, a CD out and uh, let's see, uh, some, some diseases which sometimes you just can the total out 100 percent days sometimes. So uh, if you look at the uh, this one, um, the etiological uh, point of view, uh, predominantly uh, what investigation we have to do depends upon the clinical, clinical scenario of the patient. So uh, if, if it is fluoride, as everyone knows that uh, immune related causes are predominantly rheumatoid arthritis, relaxing polychondritis, retinal randomness or, uh, um, or other antarctical vasculitis. So these are the most common uh, systemic immune mediated uh, disorders. So uh, most of the time, uh, we we try to dig out the history value and try to analyze the investigation according to the uh, treated probability of the disease. So uh, uh, this one, uh, Dr. Thomas Chilamo, she has fantastically uh, this one, uh, has outlined what all the predominant investigations have to do. Have to do. Um, in, in particular, this immune mediated uh, disorder. So definitely, we are going to we are going to do uh, this one uh, rheumatoid factor uh, and the CCP, especially if you are uh, if you are rheumatoid arthritis is high on the card. And AMA uh, and the CC, uh, AMA is one of the another important uh, this one in order to ruling in uh, a CCP disorder. And uh, ANSA so is definitely we need an ANSA. So I would like. I would like to uh, tell you some of the pitfalls in interpreting these, these, these investigations. So, uh, so rheumatoid factor, especially in case of rheumatoid arthritis, as uh, everyone knows that if a patient doesn't have any any any, any clinical scenario or uh, clinical features suggestive of rheumatoid, so uh, RF factor can be positive in almost 30 to 13 uh, percentage of the population, the young population. That that percentage actually increases uh, when if you if you look at the uh, at the age of 55, the percentage of uh, uh, no, uh, factor positivity without an uh, without an immune related disorder in that particular patient will be uh, somewhere around 40 to 50 percent of cases. So these are the, some some important pitfalls uh, while you coming into the interpreting these immunological serology, the immunological serology. So uh, coming to the AMA. ANA also uh, depends on this one. If the treatment probability of that particular disease is very high, ANA positivity has got an important role. So if you don't have an uh, this one, ANA, uh, if patient has got an ANA positivity, then definitely you have to go for an immunoblot. And immunoblot is uh, depending upon which antigen specificity and depending upon the clinical scenario, whether you're suspecting leukers, whether you're suspecting MCPD, whether you're suspecting primal coffee syndrome. Depending upon that, uh, uh, you you get that immune profile, immune blood profile uh, uh, positivity light. So uh, then ANA also again uh, you can have sometimes uh, uh, false positive ANA uh, in, in in patients also. So uh, coming to the ANSA, if you are doing an ANSA, most likely the problem here in immunofluorescent test is that in ANA uh, the gold standard definitely is ANA immunofluorescent test and also you can do IS test in uh, in Anka um, AMC also. So what we used to do is that uh, unless uh, some of the uh, this one, some of the main centers may have very experienced uh, uh, technicians or uh, or doctors who will be reading uh, experts 
who who have a expertise in dealing um, IS in AMA and also in ANSA. But majority of labs usually don't have these expertise uh, who is actually uh, leading, uh, giving a proper report in IS. So most of the time, I land up in uh, asking for uh, ELISA based tests. So uh, once uh, if your if your uh, answer is positive in IS, definitely you have to go for an ELISA based anti PR3 and PMP answer and make sure that PR3 and PMP is positive. So uh, either and another thing, another problem we used to get is that inter, uh, this one. What is the intensity of the title? So uh, some of, I've seen uh, some of the labs actually uh, reporting. Uh, ANSA values in one in one, one in ten of intensity. So that is absolute absurd. You cannot, uh, you cannot, uh, most, you cannot give a report like uh, uh, one in ten of ANSA, three ANSA, three ANSA positivity like that. Minimum that that intensity should be uh, one in eighty or one in one fifty. So uh, you actually don't want to give a report on uh, on positive report on one in ten titers. It has absolute absurd. So uh, this, is, this is a predominant problem we as rheumatologists face in uh, interpreting new immunomediated serology. So what is the title? What is the actual pattern of the uh, IS? Uh, what is the intensity um, of the of the IS? And what is the title? Most most important is the title of the value of the of the ELISA based test. So of IS uh, sometimes. So uh, these are the most important uh, pitfalls uh, and challenges we used to face while interpreting these uh, these immunotherapy. Thank you, sir. So uh, what are the um, that parameters we have to monitor to uh, look out for the side effects of the agents, the main ones at least? Yeah, uh, once you uh, start uh, on immunosuppression, um, predominantly, uh, I'm, I'm, my first choice would be either mycosinolase or mycosuppression. So, uh, uh, the thing is that mycosuspate is uh, the compliance of uh, mycosuspate will be much better than mycosinolate due to obligation. So uh, uh, this one, I, we will be actually monitoring the um, uh, the common uh, blood components, CBC, uh, inflammatory markers, LFC, and creatinine. These are the uh, most commonly done, very simple investigations used to do for monitoring that. So uh, the problem. Uh, is not actually due to, uh, especially if you are dealing with nature to uh, The problem usually uh, we face is that uh, when while selection of the patient, if the patient has got uh, a, a metabolic syndrome like seizures, like obesity, patient has got diabetes, patient has got fatty liver, these are the group of people we have to be really careful of by using nature to and uh, other immunosuppression, uh, especially nature to because. Uh, rather than the drug itself, uh, actually the metabolic syndrome will will, will put the patient uh, more riskier than the mitosuspate on that particular patient. So uh, most of the time, a very simple investigation like uh, complete test count, CSR, CRT, uh, LFC, and creatinine is usually sufficient for monitoring these uh, these these patients. So how often have to, you have to do this test? What's the uh, yeah, first uh, visit we used to uh, uh, do uh, first month and uh, after four weeks. Then after that, most of the time, eight weeks to twelve weeks is, um, is the ideal uh, time uh, to, to keep on monitoring this uh, this uh, uh, patient. And uh, I would I would like to uh, keep a cutoff of eight grams of uh, hemoglobin and uh, monitor for leukopenia and monitor for platelet count less than one gram. So about uh, like uh, azorin, uh, what, if you have a patient on azorin and he has got increased liver enzymes, what's the next type? Do you decrease the dose or you think of? Yeah, that depends upon the patient's profile. The patient has is very young fellow. Patient do not have any metabolic syndrome like CK. Patient uh, is 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 not an diabetic patient. So in that particular case, definitely we can reduce the dose of the uh, azorin and see. Whether the uh, whether it's increasing or not, but most of the time, I if, if it is not reducing in then in in another one week to two weeks, then uh, definitely you have to stop them uh, as patient. And that particular in that particular case, you have to opt for other uh, other immune suppressants like tetracycline, which is a little bit uh, uh, got a good safety profile in many diseases.
I think uh, we'll go back to the next case presentation, sir. And thank you so much, sir. I have got one. I have got one question. Uh, what is your experience of jack inhibitor in uh, rheumatology? I have used a topacitinib yeah. in a case of a necrotizing scleritis and it will be a good response. And that paper is coming in IGO, the Journal of Ophthalmology. Yeah. yeah. Actually, um, coming to Jack, Jack, Jack inhibitors, uh, in my, uh, in my uh, one, uh, the, most, the most important game changer in, in, in clinical immunology is going to be Jack inhibitors in another five years. Most of the time, uh, all these biology we will we'll go to so we'll go to uh, second year or third year or fourth year, and this is going to be the most important game changer in another four to five years. So uh, till now uh, we have got two vaccines. Uh, one is tofacitinib, and another one is baricitinib. Tofacitinib so has got uh, 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 patients uh, two or three patients on refractive rheumatoid arthritis, but luckily these patients do not have any uh, immune mediated inflammatory eye disorder. So. I do not have any experience on that use on autoimmune associated symptomatic eye disorders till now. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, sir. yes. Dr. Anoop, I have two questions for you. Yeah, sir. One is you need to answer. The second one is you don't need to answer. The one you don't need to answer is why are the names of these uh, biological jack inhibitors so difficult to pronounce? Yeah. Okay. And my question for you is that uh, what is the role of the HIV testing? Do you attribute a lot of significance to it for scleritis patients? Now, can you repeat the uh, question once again? Uh, HLA, B, HLA testing. Okay, okay, so HLA testing. HLA B27, uh, the most uh, in, uh, common HLA uh, association we look into is HLA B27 and HLA B5, B51. So, uh, HLA B52, we usually don't do. Uh, SLA B27, as everyone knows, uh, it's spondyl arthritis. All uh, patients coming with uh, anti-UVIs or, uh, or sulfur UVI disease, I usually regularly used to do SLA B27 by PCR method. Uh, because we have got uh, a lot of labs doing by flow cytometry. Uh, but I think personally believe, and there, there is reports like uh, PCR is much more sensitive than specific. Another thing is that SLA B5 and B61. Uh, we it, it is it is there are a lot of reports uh, saying that almost in especially in Bishop syndrome, uh, uh, almost uh, the odds of uh, getting an uh, uh, getting a Bishop disease to this patient is possibly for actually B5 B6 even is almost 5.6. So uh, and um, once I was attending the EULA conference and uh, the most uh, uh, the the very big expert on Bishop disease that is Asan Yatiki. Uh, was actually telling that uh, they have got almost 70 to 80 percent of, uh, of, of uh, uh, positivity rate of SLAB 5 to 61. But unfortunately, we have got uh, uh, we have got that cohort of almost 75 cases from South India with such syndrome. But our uh, our uh, SLAB 5 to 61 positivity rate is much less due to due to unknown disease. We don't know exactly. And coming to SLAB 62, uh, there are certain reports that uh, SLAB 62 can be a small association, uh, positive association that's been seen in, uh, in vascular bichet and also in tachyar Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We'll go to the case presentation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anu, for, for your valuable inputs. Uh, we have a, a challenging case-based scenario for which uh, we would like the valuable inputs from all our speakers. I invite uh, Dr. Aungshi to present her case. Uh, Dr. Aungshi is currently doing her fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at Comptor Style Hospital, Calicut. Dr. Aungshi. Hello, uh, good evening everyone. Uh, I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Laila Mohan, for giving me this opportunity. And here is uh, Dr. Nilesh uh, Madam, Dr. Shafid, uh, and Dr. Nihesha sir. Uh, we had a very interesting case a uh, couple of weeks back. A 28 year old male who had a complaint of some complaint of swelling, not just in the left eye since the past 10 years. 
he says that recently it has been gradually increasing in size. He has a history of swimming in swimming in stagnant water, and there is complaint of occasional watering and redness, but he has never sought any ophthalmological consultation for the same. Uh, he hasn't undergone any surgical intervention. He hasn't taken any medication for that. And he has no other systemic illness, no history of trauma, no history of epistasis. An examination, his best corrected visual acuity was six by six in both eyes. Extracular movement in right eye, it was full. And in left eye, it showed abduction and elevation and abduction of minus one limitation. Intraocular pressure in both eyes was normal, and a right eye anterior segment examination was within normal limits. Left eye, however, there was a brownish black, 5 millimeter into 5 millimeter into 3 millimeter swelling from 9 to 11 o'clock position nasally. Uh, about 1 to 2, it was located around 1 to 2 millimeter away from the limbus, and it was covered by a very thin layer of conjunctiva. There was heavy vascularization seen, especially on the nasal side of the swelling, with subconjunctival hemorrhage. Surrounding vessels appeared dilated and tortuous, and there were multiple white pinhead sized round deposits seen on the surface of the swelling. Okay. Okay. So we uh, cyclopedic refraction and fundus examination were done, which was within normal limits. We also did an ASOCT just to make sure that it was not a mass, a solid mass, and it just showed ecstatic cilia with slight thinning of uh, near the limbus area. Um, based on clinical examination, we came to a, a clinical diagnosis of ocular rhinosporidiosis induced to seal the mouth with a staphyloma left eye. And uh, we the patient underwent incisional biopsy just last Tuesday, and the sample was sent for a histopathological examination. So this was the uh, histopathological slide that the uh, histopathologist sent to us. So there were a number of uh, double wall cyst um, sporangia, with, which were releasing the um, sporo, with very sporoblasts in different stages of the um, and now we're planning to go ahead with excision uh, next week with excision of the conjunctiva with around uh, two millimeter normal conjunctiva and cauterization and spiral patch graft. Is there anything else that we can do differently for this patient other than what we're planning? You know that uh, the first series of uh, ocular rhinosporidiosis. It's a rhinosporid, oculosporidiosis has been described by Kuriakos from Kerala. Yes, yes. Uh, the Kuriakos from Kerala in British Journal of Ophthalmology. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, as uh, Shomshila can be uh, tell that one, I, I think this is the definitive uh, treatment for this. So the medicine doesn't work. And the diagnostic point is the granules which you see in the scler staphyloma. Surrounding it, small, small granules will be seen. Yes. That was the diagnostic pointer. Uh, but, uh, so, is it like um, when I was going through the literature, I've seen that, uh, sir, you have also uh, had similar experience and uh, you have also made a publication. There, uh, there were three steps of the management plan that was taken. First of all, it was just a conjunctival flap that could be placed on top of the uh, ectatic area. The second one was clear patch graft uh, and or amniotic graft, and the other one was corneal graft. So in our case, we are planning a scleral patch graft, but they say the chances of recurrence in scleral patch graft is very high. It's very high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I say something? Yes, sure, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this is exactly similar to the case which I had managed a few years ago. So the moment you showed the picture or the first picture itself, it was very conclusive that it was an ocular uh, sporidiasis. Yeah, and uh, a, a very close-up picture will show this very uh, those characteristics sporangia which are on the conjunctiva here. 
and this is how it classically presents in an ocular presentation where the underlying sclera gets sort of uh, melted away here and you have a ciliary staphyloma kind of a picture which is having the case which i managed was much larger than um, uh, the 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 area of scleral involvement was much larger and much extensive than what is chain what is what you're showing here so yours seems to be more contained to a particular area here so i managed a similar young individual here again the history of swimming in uh, stagnant pools is also something which is characteristically associated with rhinosporidiasis here and you have particular areas as sir mentioned which are endemic in india here and uh, I, i would go ahead and do a, a patch graft a tectonic patch graft here i have largely moved to mo doing corneal using corneal tissue itself for doing patches over the sclera itself so i would uh, the ease is because uh, we do get most of us have shifted to in situ excisions corneal scleral in situ and getting sclera is uh, is you know you have to send in a special request to our eye bank so you al always have therapeutic grade corneal tissue available to us it's easy to fashion out a uh, a patch graft with a corneal tissue here and i still use uh, and this is something which i picked up from professor donald tan when i did my fellowship under him and i always prefer to use because of the better resilience strength it is easy for handling easy for suturing and you can get large sized corneal tissue as well and in these cases where you need larger ones so you could go ahead and do a uh, do a use your corneal tissue and do a patch graft for this and always remember to cover it up with conjunctiva and do a broad excision conjunctiva uh, removing most of the conjunctiva in the surrounding region and do a conjunctival autograft in that particular region yeah. always counsel your patient that um, uh, there, there might be a risk of post operative retinal detachments in these cases because you see the, the entire um, uh, the globe complex there the external coat of the globe going right into the uh, to up to the retina is probably not going to be healthy over here you might probably want to do a prophylactic cryo all around as well when you're suturing these patients there would be intravitreal bleeds when you're doing these particular cases some amount of astigmatism as well and these patients tend to develop cataracts subsequently here so you will have him coming back to you for a cataract surgery subsequently when the, um, the 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 kind of incision placements is something which you would also look at association of secondary glaucoma and i'm very sorry i could not uh, you know add on my picture of this particular patient but i had a, a patient similar with ocular anosporidiosis and um, i had to do a very large scleral graft for him here the region uh, he was initially contained well but the the rise in pressure still goes on when he came back for his third or fourth follow up the region had become a little more ectatic though the patch graft was holding well his pressures were managed on secondary uh, on anti glaucoma medications here I did a cataract surgery but i had to do an sics for him subsequently and he still does well with about a 618 or a 612 vision when he last came for his follow up almost a year ago i think so i think you can go ahead because the, the lump always stays there and that is what they usually complain of and their vision is actually good for these patients and madam uh, right now because of this covid situation getting yeah you can hold on yeah you can oh, hold okay. on getting cornea uh, it's a cornea it's a little bit difficult to we mm. have the stored uh, sclera if if you do have sclera stored in your eye bank then yes mm. you can yeah okay the only thing is that because of its chances of recurrence like if it uh, if yeah, you... as i said do uh, do a large conjunctival excision there because okay. uh, the primary infection usually starts from the conjunctiva here so you are seeing active conjunctival spores on on top of these uh, these patients here so uh, do put them on a long term medical management as well yes we are planning on dapsone yes yes so you do need to keep them on work them up for a for a dapsone management there and take them on. Uh, is it over Uh, Leila, I want to thank uh, Dr. Vanati, ma'am, uh, for that wonderful input. Uh, she, uh, Leila, ma'am, wanted to ask JB, sir, like how far does dapsone help in long-term prevention of recurrence? Uh, I, I, I don't. I am not in favor of dapsone. I give the surgical excision is enough. 
is it necessary to add adjunctive therapy with dapsone uh, i have not uh, given dapsone to any of my rhinos for this case they do well with uh, surgical excision okay. thank you sir and uh, lela madam wanted to know have you st uh, started harvesting uh, donor cornea during this covid times Lela, ma'am, you can talk now. I think you've been unmuted. Lela, ma'am, can you? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, sir. I saw uh, Debbie sir's paper with the patch graft. Actually, that is what we were planning. But then I found lot of papers with an add-on dapsone to prevent recurrence. Can you hear me, Dalia? Yes, ma'am. You're very clear. Very clear. Yeah, yeah we have a stored sclera, and just uh, wanted to know not about this case. Have you all started harvesting donor cornea, madam? So, Dr. Somashila. Uh, yes, ma'am. We have we have to make sure that the patients have, uh, I mean, the donors have a COVID test with them, and this is from most of them are just the hospital retrievals, not the okay. voluntary donation. And we have to make sure that it's from non-COVID hospital. So it's very we have up to just ten to fifteen percent of our usual collection. It was a wonderful, wonderful discussion. Uh, infectious, non-infectious, medical and surgical management. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank uh, you. Are there any questions in the YouTube? Yes, sir. I think we'll conclude. Uh, thank you all for that uh, very interactive discussion and very useful. Uh, just to conclude, I would say that uh, as uh, JB sir pointed out, that sclera is a cause of red eye, which is not just vision threatening, but life threatening also. So we have to have an effective uh, way to approach scleritis with proper investigations and management. And wherever required, especially necrotizing scleritis, we may have to involve a Rheumatologist also to rule out the systemic causes, as uh, rightly pointed out, fifty percent of cases may have a systemic cause. So uh, I hope this session was useful to all uh, to see the next case of scleritis with a more systematic and a stepwise approach. Uh, thank, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank, thank thank you. you ma'am. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Call uh, Dr. Narupoma to say the vote of thanks. Uh, good evening. Able to hear me? Yes. On behalf of Corecord of Thermic Society and the Scientific Committee, it's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. My heart fills with lots of gratitude and respect for our distinguished guest speakers, Dr. Jyotrimay Biswas, Dr. Vanati, Dr. Somshila Murthy, and Dr. Anu, for sparing their invaluable time to enlighten us and enhance our understanding pertaining to scleritis. Thank you all. I thank all the participants and presenters for the interest shown. Last but not the least, I thank Team AICE Pharma for the brochure and platform support lended. Thanks to you all once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. 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 Thank you.